All right, welcome. Um, second time's a charm on this. I recorded a full whole lecture on this, and when I looked at it tonight before I let you guys look at it tomorrow, I realized that there was no audio with it. So second time's a charm. I'll get through this. I'm just going to re record this lecture, and this is on vestibular disorders. This is for the asynchronous class for uh, November 5th, 2020 for your cohort. Uh, like I said, I just want to let you guys know that I really appreciate how hard you worked with Dr. Reskin for the past three days for your um, in-person labs. I will let you know what next week's lab schedule is. Please bear with me. I need to find something out for me on campus. Once I have that, I will let you guys know. There is an associated quiz with this. The quiz has been posted for a while. I did make the due date next week. Uh, and then on top of that, you should have your final as well for this class. So let's talk about vestibular disorders. So with vestibular disorders, vestibular, there we go, I can speak today. We're gonna to talk about some things like review of balance coordination, talk about some introduction of vestibular disorders, do a quick anatomy review. Then we'll talk about the eval that the PT is gonna do. And then we'll talk about some dysfunction and some disease that look vestibular. So first off, we'll talk about balance, right? What is balance? It's the idea that we maintain our center of gravity over our base of support with functional control of posture. Right? It can be transitional, meaning moving from one posture to another, right? Where base of support or center of mass is changing. That can be rolling, supine to sit, sit to stand, transfers, anything like that, sliding worms. That's all transitional. It's moving from one place to another. It can be static, just sitting here, right? The ability to maintain upright and stable posture and orientation with the center of mass over my base of support with body not in motion, right? Base supports can be fixed at that point. And, you know, holding anti-gravity postures, prone on elbows, quadruped, sitting, quadruped. There's one student once said, what is quadruped? Quadruped, sitting, kneeling, half kneeling, modified plantar grade, again, where you have your hands on the table and you're kind of leaning forward where those feet are up in a kind of uh, plantar flexion or just standing. Can be dynamic, right? Dynamic balance, dynamic postural control, the ability to move and have postural stability and orientation while you're moving. Right, weight shifting, not reaching outside of the base support. We talked about this when we dealt with balance training or teaching or treatments, right? Can be skill based, ability to perform tasks while we're doing it. We can have grasp and manipulation tools, right? Where we take stuff and we're able to manipulate with our hands, especially fine motor skills. It's dexterity, it can be bipedal location for the lower extremity, it can be kicking a ball, right? That's agility. But overall, it's going to require strength. It's going to require control, reaction times, appropriate range of motions. And then to keep balance, we have those strategies, right? We have the ankle, the knee, the hip, and then the step strategy. All of those are there to keep us inside of our nice base of support and keep us upright and steady. So this is kind of looking at, from our brain's perspective, how do we do this? Well. Here we have tapping a foot without raising the heel, right? Where we're just kind of bringing the foot up, tap, tap, clapping your hands in rhythm, yeah, rhythm, rhythm. Any of that, we've got a little bit of visual input, right? I can see my hands moving, right? I can feel it. I get some somatocentric input. I've got vestibular because my body's kind of getting a little bit of feedback from all over while I'm moving. All of that kind of plays into this wheel of balance, and it provides me with a clear image of what my body is doing in space. So then the motor control is going to evolve. When we first start as little itsy bitsy babies, we don't have very good motor control. I don't know if you realize that or not. And if you look at and watch babies when they're, you know, especially when they're just starting to get moving around, they definitely don't have motor control, especially the head and the body, right? Their head often moves independent of the body and the body moves independent of the head. But overall, we develop these neural and physical and behavioral processes where we integrate things and kind of generate our ways of moving. It governs our posture, it governs our movement. We get reflexive patterns, are great examples of this, right? And as, as well as the ability to override them. Stepping patterns, right? ATNR, asymmetrical tonic neck reflexes, right? The fencer's position, withdrawal reflex, right? We pull away from stuff that could be potentially damaging stimuli. All of those can be both, you know, functional and overridden. Um, they're, they're like even let's just think about the withdrawal reflex ones right you're burning your hands 
well, could there be a time where burning your hands might be a necessity? I don't know. I mean, like, if you look at some of the movies, uh, what was the one in space, Armageddon, right, where he has to drag those nuclear cores over to a different area, and the whole time he's doing it, it's burning his hands. The body is telling him to pull his hands away, but he overrides it. Well, that's just overriding those reflexes. Doesn't mean those reflexes are wrong. It just means that you're able to override them, right? When you have a neural lesion or a problem with the brain, we've talked about this before, it often manifests in return to these reflexive movements or the presence of primitive reflexes. You know, Vinci comes back, Clonus comes back. Uh, you may get ATNR back. Stuff like that comes back into play when you've got a neural lesion. So and we talked about it before, dexterity, hands, agility, feet. But any way you have that, you also have to have some hand-eye, hand-foot coordination, right? One of the biggest problems I had growing up was hand-eye coordination. I don't have very good vision. I guess hand-foot goes along with that then. What I'm saying is I was never destined to be a soccer or a basketball player. It just wasn't in it. I was never destined to be a wide receiver in football either. It just wasn't that good with the combination of my hands and my feet, catching things, manipulating things. And then I got into the martial arts and that kind of changed my hand-eye coordination. And it didn't have a lot of carryover to other sports, but I did see that I was able to start improving my other sports because I started understanding what I was going on with that hand-eye coordination. It finally made sense to me. Get it? Made sense. Uh -huh. You also have some inner limb co coordination, right? If I'm reaching for stuff, there's a lot of stuff happening in that arm while I'm reaching, right? So there has to be inner limb. Excuse me. Oh. There also has to be some interlimb coordination, right? Whether it's two arms coordinating with each other or an arm and a leg or the arm and the legs, right? The arm and the neck, all of that comes into play. What's well, gonna require some appropriate speed, distance, direction, timing, muscular tension and distal mobility. We gotta have the ability to reach out for that type of stuff, even with the feet. And then we've gotta have the appropriate synergies, right? When I reach out for stuff, my appropriate reciprocal inhibition has to happen. Otherwise, the muscles won't fire right. Sequencing, opposing muscle groups have to work. We have to have proximal stability. We talked about this before. We can't have effective mobility unless we've got stability. And then postural control. So what happens when we see that we're missing control, right? Well, slow movement's gonna occur. You start losing control, and one of the things you're gonna start doing is slowing down. Get that bradykinesic effect. You may get tremors. You may get some obligatory synergies that are abnormal or you know, regressed. Regress synergies where you go back to pediatrics. Um, you may get fractionated movements, meaning that you break things down into little segments as you're doing them the synergies. You may become hyper or hypotonetic, right? Rigidity, spasticity, flaccidity, dystonia, any of that can come along. You can have unintentional movements, hemiblissness, right? Athletosis. Any of those type of things can occur. You can have a loss or deficit in control or of equilibrium, right? Balance kind of goes off. And then ultimately, you can get with that ataxia, right? Where it's just uncoordinated. And you know, motor plan is intact. Your brain knows what it wants to do. The plan's just not getting implemented. For whatever reason it might be, the plan is just not getting implemented. And that can be problematic for patients. So we've talked about a bunch of these conditions here and what could cause it, right? Parkinson's, MS, TBI, CP, Huntington's, chorea, cerebellar lesions. And then we'll talk about vestibular pathologies today. But it's really interesting is when we see patients that have balance disorders, a lot of times, they may include speech and swallowing disorders, which is kind of weird, but it, when you think about the fact that it all plays into cranial nerves, it makes kind of sense, right? You can get dysarthria, impaired speech due to the motor systems of speech, right? You can get a dysphagia, impaired swallowing. You can have the two different dysphagias, Wernicke's dysphagia versus Broca's dysphagia. Wernicke's is a fluent aphasia, right? But the words don't make any sense. Or they may not be able to receive or you could have receptive aphasia is also working aphasia. Or broken. 
Broca's dysphasia, where it's just not very fluent and it's almost stuttering like. Oh, look, here's that beautiful motor homunculus that comes back from anatomy, right? When there's problems with the motor cortex, usually for the most part, it's Brodmann's area four and six that are the problem, but it varies with individuals. Um, so there's our beautiful motor homunculus looking at the motor cortex and kind of remember, we used to think this is set in stone. That the way this is, is the way everyone is. We now know it's totally different based on person. We also have those latent pathways. And then we've got our descending motor pathways that send stuff from the brain down to the body, right? Descending is always motor. We have cortical bulbar, tectospinal, reticulospinal, vestibulospinal, rubrospinal, right? We have our cerebellum that regulates our motion, postural control, balance, all that type of stuff. And then we have our basal ganglia, which communicates through our dorsal columns. All of that comes into play when we're dealing with balance. Yeah, you know, here's an area showing kind of where Broca's area is, where Wernicke's area is. We talked about this briefly with the stroke, right? But if I end up with a stroke in this area here primarily, right, or TBI, my motor function is going to be greatly impacted. And then depending upon how low I go, I might actually have some Wernicke's problems. I may have some Broca's problems, right? I may have some hearing problems. It's really good if you can to get an idea on your own head, kind of what the area where the areas are, you know, so excuse me. If you can touch your head and go, oh, well, here's the primary somatosensory center cortex. Here's my primary motor cortex, right? It comes down and goes along like this. There's my somatosensory cortex coming down. There's my Wernicke's area, right? Below my Wernicke's area is my primary auditory cortex. Up here, I've got my Broca's area. If you can do that, and I'll back here is my visual cortex. If you can do that, that will help you when you deal with um, patients in the um, stroke and even vestibular patients as well. So just think about it. if you can get that, start working on it now, that'd be great. Yeah, just start studying that now, that'd be really great. So cerebellum, right, regulates our movement, postural control, and muscle tone, right? Lesions here typically produce abnormal patterns, right? And we have that closed loop, open loop system we talked about, right? Closed loop is error correction. Open loop is how we kind of program things in. The cerebellum is really heavily relying on that. So when we encounter new material, we have to develop a new loop for that, right? When you first start going to the gym, you may not be as coordinated until you get going for a longer period of time. And then you'll get this kind of loop system going. So what can happen when you have cerebellar pathologies? Well, can you can have asthenia, generalized weakness, dysarthritis, dysdidocokinesia. I'm gonna read through these. I'm not gonna go over them. So you can read just as well as anyone else. Dysmetria, dysynergia, asynergia, hypotonia, nystagmus, what we're gonna talk about today. You can have rebound phenomena and then tremors. We know that from patients that have Parkinson's, right, which leads us to our basal ganglia. And this is involved in working memory, sustained attention, right? If you, you know, the, the do, that's the dopamine center of our brain. There's no direct connections with the lower motor neurons, right? But it connects with upper motor neurons and it does the planning. So at the bottom kind of breaks down the different parts of it, obviously. The substantia nigra is probably one of the big areas that you really want to remember for your boards because again, produces dopamine, important for Parkinson's. Common problems with the basal ganglia, akinesia, brachykinesia, athetosis, chorea, choreathetosis, dystonia, hemibolismus, hyper or hypokinesis, rigidity, and then obviously the tremor, that Parkinson's tremor we've talked about before. And we look at our dorsal columns, right? They regulate our discriminatory touch, stereognosis, graphesthesia, tactile pressure, barognosis, texture. So basically all of our sensation, right? Looking at this, except for the only thing really not there is pain. It has a little bit of temperature sensation, but not a lot. When you have a problem with the dorsal column, it's really hard to differentiate between that and the basal ganglia or cerebellar impairment because they all kind of look the same when you have it. And this would be understanding, is it a CNS spinal cord injury? Or is it a CNS brain injury in order to be able to figure this out? 
when you have dorsal column problems, right? If you're having problems with all those sensations, you end up with that cowboy gait, right? You'll sway when you walk. Have uneven step lengths, lateral displacements, dysmetria, impaired motor skills. And a lot of times you end up with a positive Romberg sign, right? Where you put your feet together and kind of sway back and forth. And we looked at that with that patient when we talked about balance, right? But what about age? Does age matter for all balance? Well, absolutely, right? When we get older, we get sarcopenia. Our muscles decrease in overall strength. And it's not our fault. We just, overall, our body declines with time. Our reaction times go down, right? Can be associated with both decreased strength, range of motion, increased time to process information. That stimulus response curve gets greater. And then our motor planning just kind of goes to whack when we get older. Decreased range of motion, though, becomes a big problem. Right? When we have balance problems, maybe our hips don't react as well, so we lose that strategy and balance. It'd be huge. Postural changes, right? If I start getting that kind of forward hunched posture, now my base of support is vastly different than it used to be. So what can be some barriers to testing? Well, consciousness and arousal, right? Well, we can't test people's balance and talk about vestibular disorders if they're not awake. Uh, are they oriented? How's their cognition? Do they have attention, right? Do they have frontal lobe injury where they can't pay attention to anything? How's their communication? Are they able to verbally communicate and also receptively communicate, meaning hear and understand you? What's their memory look like? Do they have anterior or retrograde amnesia? Do they have delirium or dementia, right? Any of those things comes into play. Well, now we, we have real trouble testing their balance and kind of teasing out where is this balance problem stemming from? Is it truly vestibular, which we're gonna talk about, or is it back here in the central nervous system? So I wanna talk about consciousness real quick because I know I missed this when we talked about the Glasgow Coma Scale. But we have the five levels of, levels of consciousness from descending order from the most conscious to the least, right? We have full consciousness, we have lethargy, abundation, stupor, and coma, right? And then when we're coming out of those, we get arousal where the ANS starts responding to things. Patients start reacting. They respond to physical stressors like pain. We talked about the Glasgow Coma Scale. You know that lower is worse, right? Usually when a patient is in a coma, true coma time is generally limited. They usually end up in either from stupor to lethargy for quite a period of time, right? They can end up in this persistence of vegetative state that can last a year or longer after TBI. And if they have an anoxic event, it can be three months or longer. Right, so any of this can cause a patient to get stuck in this level of consciousness that's not appropriate for us for testing them. And then we talk about equilibrium versus non-equilibrium, right? Equilibrium talks about standing or balance activities, the ability to maintain equilibrium statically and dynamically. Non-equilibrium refers to supported sitting activities, right? The ability to perform components and movements in that type of setting. So think wheelchair when you think non-equilibrium. Equilibrium, we've got balance activities where we actually have to maintain our center of gravity or center of mass over our center of gravity. So coordination, that can come into play because coordination can affect our balance. How's our range of motion? Is it smooth? If we ask them to reach out and touch a pen, are they reaching out and touching the pen? Or are they smacking themselves in the face? If we ask them to pick something up, if I ask them to reach out and pick something up, are they actually reaching out and picking it up or do they get halfway and drop it, right? You can test this with my left hand. Eventually, if I hold this long enough, I'm not gonna, it's not gonna be a happen now because I want it to happen. There are times where I'm holding this and the left hand just goes, nope, and drops it. It happens, right? Sensation, is it intact? Are you having me close my eyes and reach out and let's see. All right, so I've got a pair of scissors. I've got a pen. I've got a remote. And you ask me to put them out on the table and you tell me, okay, reach out and find the one that's the pen. Well, with my right hand, I can do it easy, right? My left hand, I, mean, I can reach out for stuff. And what you'll notice with somebody that's got sensation issues, is exactly what I do is I'm going to tilt the camera down slightly for this. And it still isn't tilt low enough. But when I'm reaching for stuff, you'll find that I broad face it. I really kind of lay my hand on it because I have deep pressure sensation. I have varignosis in there, but I don't have a lot of fine motor sensation. 
So it's really hard for me to pick something up if my eyes are closed and know what it is, right? So I can pick this up and I know that I've got a hook up here somewhere because I can feel it, I felt it dig into my hand. So I'm pretty sure those are my scissors, right? But if you give me two objects that are really close, um, you know, there we go, this actually works. Where I have a stack of paper and a remote control and you lay them down and I know which way they went so it doesn't help me at all, right? But I could put these down and they're pretty common in shape so I'm not going to be able to specifically tell you with the sen without sensation which is which. I can't identify it. I lack that stereognosis. Um, gross motor skills. What's my body posture look like? I'm hunched away forward. What's going on with my body posture? How's my use of my large muscle groups, right? Am I using them appropriately? Or am I substituting? What's my dexterity look like? Ooh, can I manipulate stuff? Can I hold a pen? Can I do that three jaw chuck grip with the pen? Can I do lateral apprehension, right? Can I do any of that type stuff? You know, what does my postural control look like? Do I have writing reflexes? So if I start leaning over the side, do I know that and start correcting it, right? Do I have anterior writing? Do I have posterior writing? Do I have lateral writing? Am I looking at where I'm at in space? Does my head have it, right? So maybe, you see me leaning like this, but my head goes like this. Well, what am I doing? I'm writing my head so my vision is upright, right? So I know that my body is going this way. So my ob what I try to do is write my vision because of it. Well, now you can tell me, what's your body feel like? Well, I don't know, right? That can be a problem with patients. How does my weight distribute? Like me, like right now, I can tell you, I'm sitting heavier on my left butt cheek than my right butt cheek. How do I know that? Well, this chair sucks, first of all. I have to get a new one. And I'm sitting on the actual metal rails inside the chair. And I can feel it heavier on my left side than my right side. Well, why might that be? Well, I'm left-handed, even though I've got no sensation in my left hand. Thank you very much, right? But I'm left-handed, so I tend to lean on my left side a little bit more. Right? Think about it when you're writing, which side do you lean on, right? Um, what does my balance look like? What do my motor strategies look like, right? When my limits of stability are reached, right? And center of mass is disturbed, what do I do? What balance strategies kick in? Do I have balance strategies? And when I do, what's my sensory integration? I can do the sit sit we talked about before. We can run cranial nerve integrity tests. Just what does my brain look like, right? We can do a functional MRI where we're actually measuring the parts of my brain that are lighting up when I'm doing activities. That can be really useful for telling us, well, maybe I've got a, a broadness problem. So this is just kind of looking at different techniques for both testing patients and, and working with patients, right? With fixation being the easiest way to do things. And then we're alternating reciprocal movements being a lot harder. So this kind of goes through just a general quadrant of having to work with a patient. So what kind of balance testing can we do? We can do the Romberg, right? We can also do sharpen the Romberg. We can do functional reach tests and multi-directional reach tests. We can do the Berg. We can do the Poma. We can do sit to stand. There are two different sit to stand tests. There's the five times sit to stand, and then there's the 30 second sit to stand. Five times is great, right? But think about it. If we do 30 seconds worth of sit to stand tests, we're gonna get more data, right? So I don't understand why you wouldn't do the 30 second one and just do five unless you know that it's going to take them longer than 30 seconds to do five sits of stands. But they're exactly like sense. Have the patient stand, sit down and stand up five times. What do they look like? Have the patient sit down and stand up 30 seconds. What do they look like? The tug, we talked about already, right? Timed walking tests, like the six-minute walk test. And then there's a thing called the balance efficiency scale that you can also use. Most of these are in your book. I just am kind of going talking about them as we go through. The Romberg's the big one, of course, that we go through. This is kind of the testing procedure, right? You're going to have the patient stand with feet together, level ground. You saw this with the, that one video that they showed, arms at their sides, eyes open. And then examiner stands facing the patient with their arms out to keep the patient in case they fall, right? You want to catch them before they fall in. Observe the patient. Is there any sway? And then you're going to have the patient close their eyes. Do they sway after that? And then we're going to kind of indicate whether it's a positive or a negative test. 
the Romberg test is really, really good for predicting patients with falls or for falls. But, you know, the Romberg test is going to in indicate some form of ataxia, right? So we have to be paying attention to that. Vision can compensate. They may not sway when their eyes are open. Then as soon as you close and knock that vision out, they're all over the place. Um, cerebellar and vas vestibular disease is indicated if a patient can't stand with their feet together, right? We may have to look to see if it's cerebellar or vestibular. Diabetic neuropathy, right? If they can't feel their feet, why are we doing this to them? Because we know that they're going to have problems. A negative Romberg test, though, does not rule out vestibular problems. Negative Romberg test can rule out maybe balance issues, maybe cerebellar, stuff like that, but it doesn't necessarily rule out that you don't have a problem with the inner ear. And this test is appropriate up to the ages of 80, and I've seen it used beyond 80 as well. But we know that it's really highly specific and sensitive up to 80. So let's get into vestibular now that we've kind of had a review of balance. So first thing we're going to start off with is an anatomy review of the ear. So we have the external ear first, right? We have the auricle or the pinna, that nice big flappy piece of cartilage and skin that we have out here. We have the ear hole, the external auditory meatus. That's gonna come in, right? Let me get my little drawer tool up here. That's gonna come in, my ear hole is gonna come in to my ear canal, right? And lead in here to my eardrum, also known as tympanic membrane. And then I got my three little bones of hearing and then I've got this down here, which is my eustachian tube, which connects my ear into my throat, right? That's why you have somebody that's an ear, nose, and throat specialist. And then I have my cochlea. I like to think the cochlea is the snail of the ear. We have our semicircular canals. They're semicircular because they're you know, not a complete circle, right? And then we have our nerves. And we usually think about vestibular cochlear because that's our common one, right? There's our cochlear branch, there's our vestibular branch. But the one we often forget about is we do have a facial nerve that comes down here and innervates the stapes. And so the facial nerve does play a little bit into play with our balance. So we have to be paying attention. We have to do those cranial nerve tests. So then we have the bony labyrinth, right? The bony labyrinth kind of houses the membranous tubes of the inner ear. It's the hardest bone of the skull, right? The temporal bone. Inside the bony labyrinth, we have the membranous labyrinth, which is like the inner tube inside of a bike tire. So the bony labyrinth protects the membranous labyrinth. And that's where you'll find your vestibular apparatus and your cochlea, right? Which is just one big tube. So your cochlea interacts with all of those semicircular canals. They're all filled with the same type of fluid. We also have an endolymphatic sac. That's the drainage area of the inner ear. Right. Um, just trying to see if I don't remember if my picture actually has the endolymphatic sac. I don't think it actually has it on here, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I actually don't really have too much about that on here. But the endolymphatic sac is, you know, your drainage, right? It's going to drain down into that uh, eustachian tube, right? Or the inner ear tube. So the vestibular nerve itself bifurcates into two branches, right? So we have the superior division. And the way to remember the superior division is it goes, once that once it splits off vestibular cochlear and goes vestibular, the superior division goes to the LSU, right? So superior LSU, obviously that's an easy way to remember it. No, please don't say that, LSUs, whatever. I don't want to talk about football. Don't start me on Penn State. Lateral canal, superior canal, and the utricle, the superior branch goes to. The inferior branch goes to the posterior canal and the saccule. There's no real way to remember that one, unfortunately. But if you remember LSU, it only leaves you posterior and saccule to, for the inferior division. The vascular supply to the ear is really fragile. The arteries are really tiny, right? They all come from the AICA and the basilar artery, right? That almost comes off of the circle of Willis, right? And if you look, that's a lot of tiny little branches and splits and curves and everything like that. And it feeds everything we have. Because these are living apparatuses, we need blood to that area. So even if you have a stroke, if you have a stroke in the anterior vestibular artery, that's going to knock out most of the blood flow to your semicircular canals. And if that's the case, well, your balance is going to suffer. 
So why would we want to treat patients with balance and dizziness, right? A couple of things, like you're going to work with old people primarily. And let's face it, old people, not always the nicest people in the world, right? It's also really difficult because a lot of them are going to have multiple comorbidities. Dizziness itself is a silent disease, right? People go years with dizziness and they go to the doctor and they just give them meds and meds and meds and meds. And the meds don't do anything. And the patient's like, well, this isn't doing anything. So the doc ups the dosage, changes the med, right? Meds may not be the answer. It's a really difficult concept to understand. Even at this level that I'm gonna talk through to you guys, by the time I'm done here, a lot of you are gonna have fried brains. The vestibular, what? The auto weight wipe rocks in my head, right? Vomit, so much vomit. Just gonna tell you now, if you're working the vestibular, get ready for vomit, like vomitus maximus, vomitus cometus, the technicolor yawn, it's all coming. Have a trash can handy. That being said, it can be really rewarding. And why can it be really rewarding? Because you could be that one person that treats a patient who's had dizziness and balance issues for six years, and they come to see you for five treatments, and they're so much better. It can be amazingly rewarding. It can also be amazingly frustrating, don't get me wrong, but it can be really rewarding as well. So let's look at dizziness. About 5.5% or greater than 15 million people develop dizziness, right? It's one of the most common complaints. Prevalence increases the older we get. Patients over 75, it's the number one reason they go to the physicians. And then if they do go to the physician for it, about 70%, just about three quarters of them report symptoms continuing at the two week follow-up. And then 63% of those with persistent dizziness report recurrent symptoms beyond three months. So think about that, like two thirds of the people, once they get out to three months, they still have problems. Well, when we're treating vestibular disorders, we have to figure out one of two things. Is it peripheral or is it central? Why do we have to know that? Well, because peripheral we can treat, typically central we have to habituate. We can't fix the brain. It's not like we have a magic tool that you can take out your, um, your magical screwdriver and wave it over their head and fix central nervous system issues, right? It doesn't work that way, especially if it's the brain stem. You, you got problems there, you're not gonna be able to fix that. So we're gonna have to teach them to learn to live with it, habituate them to it, right? Versus peripheral, where we may have some treatments we can do for it. It involves the ear and all the components that go along with it. So we may have some treatments for that. So the peripheral vestibular system has three primary functions. The number one function is stabilization of the visual image on the fovea of the retina during head movement to allow for clear vision. That's a lot of words. It's basically saying if I move my head one of the main jobs of the vestibular system is that I can still read while I'm moving my head, right? That I can keep focus. Ooh, there's a little dizziness. Also maintaining postural stability, especially during movement of the head, right? If I don't have that and I'm walking and suddenly something catches my attention, I turn my head rapidly, I'm gonna fall. It provides information for spatial orientation. Where am I at in space? So, the peripheral vestib system, the PVS, right, has semicircular canals and otolith organs. So the semicircular canals are the horizontal, right, horizontal, meaning this way, right, or lateral canals, the superior or anterior canals, and the posterior or vertical canals. So the horizontal and vertical canals are really easy to kind of think of the way they're oriented. The superior or the anterior canals are oriented at a little bit of an angle, so it can be a little more difficult to kind of grasp them. And then we have the otolith, or otherwise known as the stone of the rocks in the head organs, right? We have the utricle and the saccule. So we have the SCCs, the semicircular canals. Angular head rotation stimulates these to varying degrees, right? So the SCCs, are filled with this endolymph, this really thick kind of viscous fluid, it's a little thicker than water, that moves freely within the canals in response to the direction of the head. Key thing here though, is patients that have vestibular issues, often one of the major problems they have is dehydration. And that kind of makes sense. If they're dehydrated, right? When they're dehydrated like that, all the fluid in their body is gonna get thicker. 
if that fluid in their ear gets thicker, it makes it more difficult to respond to head movements, right? So that means they're going to report larger chances of being dizzy. The semicircular canals enlarge at one end to form the ampulla, which then leads to the cupula, which is the gelatinous barrier that contains the sensory hair cells. The hair cells are the kinocilia and the stereocilia, right? These are the hair cells that are seated in the crista, crista ampullaris, right? The sensory organ is a rotation is what that means. So up at the top here, we have a really good kind of picture of here's our crista ampullaris, right? Which is that interaction with all the nerves. And then here's our cupula that's out here. And then we have our hairs coming off of it. Yay, right? With our hairs, we have two different types again. The ears then, and still cilia is in your nose as well, right? The stereocilia are the smaller fibers, right? The smaller fibers are the stereocilia. The kinocilia are the larger fibers. And the way I always remember that is if I win kino, I win big. So that's the big fibers. And when I think of things in stereo, I think of many things hitting me at the same time. So the smaller fibers. If that works for you, great. If it doesn't, I can't help you. Sorry. Right? They're mechanical sensory organelles, meaning they detect deformation of those fibers. They convert the mechanical movements into electronical signals, electronical, electrical signals. So when they detect movement of themselves, they convert that into a signal that gets sent to the brain. The range in bundles of 30 to 300. You can see the one picture that I have down there. That's actually a picture of inner ear hairs. You can see how kind of, I think that's at like 3000 high magnification. I forget what it is, um, but they're magnified pretty heavily. And if you look over here in the upper corner, right over here, there's our serocilia, there's our kinocilia, and there's our rocks in our ears, right? The autoconia that lay in the endolymph. Those provide a weight for shifting back and forth. And it's real funny when you have a patient that first actually gets a doc that understands vestibular issues because the doc will tell them about the autoconia and the patient will come see you in therapy and be like, man, the doc said the rocks in my head are messed up. Yep, and you probably have a labia tear in your shoulder too, right? So what happens here? Well, you can either have depolarization or hyperpolarization. Guess what we're gonna come back to in a few minutes here. You remember that good old fashioned um, action potential curve? Oh yeah, that's coming back here, baby. So depolarization occurs when the deflection of the stereocilia move towards the kinocilia. So when they get together, they depolarize, right? When they move away from the kinocilia, that hyperpolarizes or inhibits them. Depolarization, excitation, hyperpolarization, inhibition. Now, there is this thing called the push-pull dynamic with this, right? So the push-pull dynamic says when the head is turned towards the right, the hair cells in the right semicircular canal are excited, while the hair cells in my left semicircular canal are inhibited. What's going to happen there, right? My stereocilia over here are moving towards my kinocilia, and over here they're moving away from it. So I'm going to get hyperpolarization over here, depolarization over here. That tells me my head is moving right. Oh, this action potential curve, right? Remember that all of our things kind of function about minus 70 degrees or minus 70 millivolts. And we get those graded potentials that come along until we hit that threshold potential about minus 55, right? It gets to that point and bam, the threshold fires off, right? So that stereocilia, right? So let me draw some stereocilia here. So here we have some little fibers. And then we've got our big daddy coming in here. There's our kinocilia, right? So those stereocilia, for whatever reason, get knocked into this a couple of times. Well, now that maybe they don't get totally, maybe it's only one. So getting those little graded potentials, right? Remember those. Then all of a sudden, bam, they get knocked over and this thing takes a ride. At that point, depolarization occurs, just like it occurs anywhere else. Sodium ions come rushing in, and you get a firing off of a signal. Once that fire off signal happens, and you get to a point where you don't need that firing off signal anymore, your head tells you where you are in space, repolarization occurs. So there goes potassium ions out, right? And you're going to drop down. Now, for a short period of time, when I'm over here, 
remember this side is hyperpolarized. It's inhibited unnaturally. So naturally it's taking me down below negative 70 millivolts. Why is it doing that? It's trying to keep me from firing over here because I'm turned to the right, right? But eventually even the right side is gonna hyperpolarize. And while it's hyperpolarized, doesn't matter how much further I turn to the right, I know I'm to the right until it kind of levels back off and I get back to that resting membrane potential. Oh yeah, you thought that you were done with that, didn't you? Nope, 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 it comes back. So here's kind of looking at it, right? So most people, and I'm saying most, it varies. Most people in their inner ears, they have spikes of kind of um, resting potentials firing at anywhere from 70 to 100 spikes per second. So that's just this constant tonic firing rate, right? So now when I turn to my left, when I turn to my left, this side is going to go up in firing rate. This side is going to go down. Typically, when you turn, they move in about the same pattern. So if I turn my head to the left and this goes up by 90, this side's going to go down by 90. Key thing is it can't really get to zero. It'll get really close, but not quite to zero. Because right? that would be an inhibitory cutoff if it got that low. Now I know this slides, this slide shows going up to 180 and 10 on the other side. You know, there's a lot of different variations that happen about it, right? But if you just remember that if this side goes up, this side goes down when I'm turning towards it. So if I turn to the right, now this side goes up, this side goes down, and it's tonic firing rate. Out of that, we go into the otoliths, right? The otoliths are the saccule and the utricle, the saccule and the utricle. They respond to linear acceleration and static head, head tilt. So I'm going to give you some hints here to remember this. Utricular excitation occurs during horizontal linear acceleration or static head tilt right? So moving head while you're in the car or looking forward through a front window, anything in the horizontal plane. Saccular excitation occurs when you're going up and down, vertical linear jumping. So what I usually like to remember is you move forward and you jump in a sack. So you trickle linear, right? Saccular up and down, linear up and down. Understand here, though, the normal endolymph and stuff like that that we have in the cupula have the same density and everything. So when a bolus of debris moves the canal or moves the cupula, the mechanics of the ear changes, right? And it may cause artificial fire in the ear, right? So if you get something where maybe a piece of that rock breaks off and floats around, that's what's causing these patients vertigo, is when this endolymph becomes an abnormal density. Right, so maybe a rock piece breaks off, or maybe it becomes too thick because they're dehydrated. Anytime that happens, that's where vertigo comes into play. We're going to talk about those terms in a little bit here, right? Well, what about the CNS? We talked about the PNS. What about the CNS? Well, primary CNS vestibular input comes from the brainstem, right? And MRI seems to show that the parietal and the insular region are the cortical region location for processing vestibular information. There is connections between the vestibular cortex, the thalamus, and the reticular formation that allow the vestibular information to contribute to the ability to be aroused. Not aroused like that, meaning aroused like wake up, right? The consciousness awareness of your body, where it is in space. And the discrimination between movement of you and movement of the environment, right? Just imagine what it would be like if we could actually feel the movement of the earth and we didn't have the inertia that we have that we talked about in physics, where we'd have to worry about feeling us moving forward at 10,000 meters per second. That would really throw us off, right? But we have to understand that the body does kind of regulate. And I also wonder, wonder if sometimes when the patients have these symptoms, if it's not their body's inertia that's being thrown off too. But that's, I just went totally off on the sidetrack there, right? Then we've got cerebellar connections. And cerebellar specifically, one of the major things is our vestibulo-ocular reflex. Connection between our vestibular system and our eyes, right? So what our C and what our brain interprets is our position. So if I tilt my head like this, my inner ear tells me my head is tilted. My eyes tell me my head is tilted. Well, what would happen if I tilt my head like this? My eyes tell me my head is tilted, but my inner ear is like, 
Nope, everything's okay. I have a unilateral dysfunction on my left side or something, or bilateral at that point, even. Oh, that could really mess you up, right? And that would lead to vomitus maximus because now I'm getting conflicting information, right? Especially if it's really bad, right? So if I'm spinning around in the chair, wee, 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 and you stop me. And my eyes get the focus that I'm not moving anymore, but my inner ear is saying, oh no, you're still moving, right? Did you ever get off a boat? And you get off a boat or get out of a pool and you still feel like you're kind of floating back and forth, right? That's because your inner ears have not stabilized to a static ground surface anymore. Your inner ear has actually adjusted, right? And adjusted that tonic firing rate to compensate for the constant sway back and forth of the boat or the water in the pool. And you get out in dry land and all of a sudden you're like, oh, right? Some people can't adjust to that movement and they get seasick. If they get on that boat and they can't get that tonic firing rate to adjust. And so they're on there and they feel every motion of the boat and they're going back and forth and they're going back and forth. And the next thing, right, again, vomit, so much vomit. So the vestibular spinal tract helps us with our posture during static and dynamic activities. And then our cortical bulbar tract helps us to coordinate those static and dynamic activity motions for posture with the coordination of our limbs. So we talked about tonic firing. We talked about the VOR. We talked about the push pill, push pill, push pull, right? Talked about inhibitory cutoff where if I turn so far enough that this side's gonna be kind of shut off, right? We also have the velocity storage system, which we'll talk about. So we talked about that tonic firing rate briefly, right? Somewhere between 70 and 100 spikes per second, right? So when you have a high tonic firing rate, it means the vestibular systems can detect head motion through excitation and inhibition. The higher you are, the better you are kind of detecting individual emotion. Now there's also some studies show that also opens you up to greater chances of getting sick. Then maybe somebody with a lower tonic firing rate maybe doesn't get as motion sick. But again, there's studies showing each way of that too. But that's kind of that tonic firing. So those ears are constantly firing at a certain rate. Now I turn my head, this one's gonna fire faster, this one's firing slower, I can't do that. It's not possible. So then we have the VOR, right? The vestibular ocular reflex. And there's two terms you have to understand. There's gain and then there's phase. VOR gain, I'm going to say this, please star this. VOR gain is the relationship between the head moving one direction and the eyes moving the opposite with equal velocity. So if I'm focused on this monitor here and I turn my head, right? If I turn my head at five meters per second, my eye should move back at five meters per second. Does that make sense, right? So if I turn my head rapidly at five meters per second, my eye should go back to the center at five meters per second. I should literally not notice a difference, right? Now, if I go to the left, I've got some difference. And I know that you can't really see it because I don't have friend, friends with goggles. I wish I did. Maybe I have to order some. So that's where phase comes into play. The OR phase is the timing relationship for the head and eye position. It's the ratio of gain. So if I move to the right at one meter per second, the eyes come back at one meter per second, the phase would be one to one. If I move to the right at one meter per second, and my, or let's say five meters per second, and my eyes move back at one meter per second. So there's a delay. The phase would be off and I would be at a five to one ratio, right? That would tell us there's a problem with my vestibular ocular reflex and it can lead to all kinds of other issues. We can be looking there at cerebellum and seeing if there's some problem there that's causing this. It allows for our head movement to coordinate with eye movements. Why? For the changing environment. It allows us to react to our environment that push-pull mechanism, right, is the idea that if I turn my head, the one side fires higher, the other side fires lower. It leads to difficulties with gaze stabilization if we don't have it. If I turn my head like this, and my inner ear is not able to tell me that I'm turning my head, but my eyes say I'm turning my head, and they're not able to readjust on time, it's going to cause all kinds of problems with motion perception. There is that inhibitory cutoff, which I talked about it, when the hyperpolarization of the hair cells in the opposite labyrinth can only decrease the firing rate to zero. 
you can't decrease to a negative rate in this side. And honestly, when you look at most of the studies, it says the lowest they go is about one or 0.01 spikes per second or something to that effect. It rarely does it go to total zero. But what it's saying is I never go to negative. That would be weird. Right, my hyperpolarization is only going to go to a point where I can't fire over here. The VSS, or the vo velocity storage system. Think of this like a battery. Okay, so don't get heavy into this because this is way high level. You need to know the velocity storage system exists. You know that it's th the purpose of it is to assist the brain in detecting low frequency head rotation. So slight tilts of the head. Right, it allows the head to adjust slightly with the cupula when it's deflected, but not totally. So if you have minor head motions, it allows the brain to react to it. Know that I don't necessarily have to whip my eyes back the other direction, right? Minor head motion, your eyes don't really need to move all that much, right? It'll be really bad if I go minor motion like this and my eyes are right, rotating back. It knows that there's a stored charger. It says, okay, if I go by a certain degree, I don't need to make a change. So then we get smooth pursuits. So this is the ability in order to, let me see what I've got this nice and shiny in here. Do I have anything nice and shiny? No, I got it. That's not bad. What do I have that's something? can follow in here. Give me a pen or something. All right, there we go. We got a pen. And we'll take this nice green eyeglass cloth, right? The brighter the color is, the easier it is to follow, typically, right? As long as you're not colorblind. So I get this pen and I've got a nice color on that gives me something to see. Yeah, I got a flag. Fun with flags. Um, smooth pursuit is if I'm following this, is my eye able to track this independent of head movement, right? This happens when you get pulled over for you suspected DUI, right? I'm getting rid of the screen thing, whatever. Um, and the officer's gonna tell you, follow my pen with your eyes and your eyes only. Two reasons he's doing that. Number one, can you follow commands? If you're drunk, you don't follow commands very well. The other reason, he's checking to see what's going on inside your brain. Is your brain slowed? So you're following the pen all around, going up to the side here, right? What he's looking for is, does he do, do this? And it'll say, follow it with your eyes only, please. Okay, he's got enough to suspect you of drinking and driving, right? Saccades. Saccades is uh, the ability to follow rapid voluntary eye movements to reposition. I like to think of saccades as staring at a basketball while it's spinning. So if you're staring at a basketball while it's spinning, you focus on those lines. Excuse me. Saccades is the ability to focus on the next line as it's passing by. If you watched any of those concussion videos, actually you did, you watched the video with um, Danny Carcillo. I got, I'm having brain problems. Where they had that multicolored scarf and he was moving it back and forth. What he was testing there for was saccades. Testing, is the able to, eye able to focus on the very next line coming across or is there a delay? Does it take some time? And again, this is in, you know, voluntary movement without head movement. Then we've got the autoconia or autoconia, right? These are the rocks in your head, Doc. Right? These are the stones they are made of calcium carbonate and they're embedded in that gelatinous endolymph and it provides inertial mass. If you just have the fluid, the fluid's great. It's really hard to detect fine motions of fluid. So these stones lay in it and they provide a mass so when the fluid moves, the stereonkinocilia get deflected. If I move to the right, my fluid should move to the right. If I move to the left, my fluid should move to the left. If I move forward, my fluid should move forward. That's kind of the idea. And those stones allow for it. The stones are tethered in that gelatinous match, match, or matrix, right? But sometimes they break off. 
and then when they break off, they become free floating. And when they come free floating, they can really throw everything off, right? So what if, you know, I've got a piece of stone that's broken off and it starts flowing in the direction of leaning left, but I'm upright. Now all of a sudden my body feels like my inner ear is going and one of my ears is saying, hey, you're going to the left. Maybe this one gets cut off because I get an inhibitory cutoff because that stone's causing it. That can be really problematic. And we do have a system for that in our body. The, the body will actually just process that out through the vestibule, right? And for the most part, it doesn't affect us that much. You may get a little bit, especially if you've been bedridden for a long period of time. Sometimes you can get a little bit of problems with your vestibular system where you get smacked in the head and a piece that breaks off, right? But for the most part, it happens every day to us. The little pieces of the stones break off they get sucked into the vestibule, they're gone, we never notice it. But the problem becomes when the stones float and affect the flow of the endolymph, that causes us to have problems. They do vary in size, right? You can see the pictures up there in the corner. And as the gelatinous membrane makes, breaks them down, they fragment, they fissure, they pit, they may, that stuff holding them together may weaken. And so then you get free floating stones. You can get free floating chunks of stones and that can really throw things off. Now, the problem is when we're talking about this, you've got to think about those semicircular canals. They exist in our ear here. Um, and again, if you haven't, please, honestly, I, I can't remember if we did, but I, I think we did. I think we went to the body's exhibit. Maybe we didn't as a class. We may have to plan that for once where, I can't remember off the top of my head, somebody remind me if we did. Um, I can't, I lose track if it was this cohort or the last cohort, honestly, I'm getting old, please forgive me. Um, I remember going at the last cohort specifically, I can't remember going with you guys, honestly. But it would be really beneficial because when you see how small the semicircular canals are, you really get to appreciate the fact that we can't really x-ray this and see this, right? Because the semicircular canals are tiny, there's no way we're going to get the fine membrane breakdown to see this gelatinous membrane. So the only thing we can go on is the symptoms that the patient presents with, right? So we usually talk in vestibular issues of whether it's a stable or unstable disorder, right? Stable disorders are vestibular neuritis, anterior vestibular ischemia, labyrinth vestibular concussions, labyrinthitis, right? Unstables, or we talk about BPVV, it would be unstable because those rocks are moving. We'll talk about that. Meniere's, which is a disease we'll talk about. Recurrent viral vestibular neuritis, right, where it keeps coming back. Acoustic neuromas or acoustic schwannomas. Perilymphatic fistulas, holes where there shouldn't be. That would be bad, right? A fistula is a hole where there's not supposed to be a hole. If you get a fistula in your abdo abdominal cavity, you have a hole going somewhere that there's not supposed to be a hole. And again, that could be a problem. You also have this thing called a superior canal dehiscence. And so dehiscence, you're gonna learn about this when we talk about wound care next semester, but dehiscence means ripping off. So sometimes in severe conditions, that superior canal just rips off. Um, I've not encountered somebody with that. I don't treat vestibular disorders on a regular basis. I had treated occasionally back when I was in Pennsylvania, but not so much here. Just think about that for a second, if that canal just gone, that's gonna seriously mess up your vestibular system, right? And then some other vestibular disorders, persistent postural perceptual dizziness, right? Vestibular proxima, we'll talk about age-related dizziness is imbalance, ARDI. This is a big one we talk about with patients. Age-related dizziness is imbalance is literally just saying, you're getting old, things are breaking down, right? It may not be vestibular in nature, it may just be Unfortunately, that the inner ear that you have is just not functioning anymore. It's gotten old. You can get autoimmune ear diseases, migraine associated dizziness. I get this quite frequently that when I get a really, really bad migraine, my vestibular problems kick up into full swing and I get really, really dizzy from it. A TBI. Yep, you can get definitely vestibular issues from TBIs. Brainstem and cerebellar disorders. An Arnold Chiari malformation. I don't remember if we talked about this. I'm hoping Dr. Um, Sokal talked about this in patho, but an Arnold Chiari malformation is where the brain kind of comes down through the frame and magnum, right? And there's different levels of it as well. 
MS can cause this. Well, it makes sense, right? MS is plaques forming in the brain or the spinal cord or the nerves. Well, yeah, then we probably have some vestibular issues. And there's some other non-vestibular dizziness that can occur, cervicogenic dizziness I'll talk about briefly, hyperventilation. <laughs> Doing that right there, you know, you get that little blood rush and all of a sudden you get kind of a red out because you've got so much oxygen. Well, that actually make me dizzy. <laughs> Um, high blood pressure should be HTN. Um, I, I did not change that. I apologize. I've got to change that to HTN. Hypo and hyperglycemia all can lead to non-vestibular dis dizzinesses. So what happens? PT comes in and the patient you know, wants to be seen for vestibular issues. What do we do? Well, the, pa the PTs, first of all, can do a thorough background check on the patient, do a thorough past medical history everything the patients encountered. Did they have a stroke five years ago? What does their heart look like? What does their brain look like? Going through anything that could possibly rule out in order to kind of hone in more. This is following those breadcrumbs, right? And then we're gonna start identifying symptoms. Now, what I'm going to say here is the book definition and the definition that is going to be on your boards. Why do I say that? Because a lot of times in clinics, there's no separation between dizziness and vertigo, or even lightheadedness, honestly. Usually they all fall under that idea of just kind of disequilibrium. But these are the definitions by your book that should be used on your boards. So dizziness is a vague sensation of lightheadedness or feeling tendency to fall, typically the sensation of the body moving when it's not really moving. So dizziness, body moving, not really moving. Vertigo sensation that the environment is moving, not really moving, right? So dizziness would be, I'm sitting here and I feel like I'm doing this, right? Vertigo, right? And I like to think about this because I'm, again, a big, huge comic book geek. And in the DC world, we have Count Vertigo. Count Vertigo causes the room to spin for people. And it causes them not to be able to stand upright and it affects their vestibular system. It's actually a really cool, like the guy that designed him was a neurologist and thought, well, what happens if we have a superhero or supervillain actually that can mess with people's vestibular systems? Then even Superman would be affected. It's actually kind of a neat idea, right? But vertigo is the idea that the environment's moving, right? So what's a patient gonna say if they've got dizziness? Oh, I feel like I'm just kind of floating off in space here, right? What are they going to see if they have vertigo? Oh boy, the room's spinning, right? And you can have both. You can feel like you're moving and the room is moving. And a lot of times when you have too much to drink, that's what it feels like, right? Lightheadedness is a feeling of faint, right? It's the feeling that you're just getting ready to pass out or experience syncope. Sometimes can be caused by other non-vestibular issues like hypotension, hypoglycemia, anxiety, right? Some people when they get real severe anxiety attacks, they start feeling lightheaded, right? They may also feel dizziness and vertigo. Disequilibrium is just the feeling of being off balance, right? So patient, what's the patient gonna say with that? I just feel off. Every time I stand up, I just feel like I'm not fully standing up. I don't feel right. Well, you ask them, is the room spinning? No, are you feeling like you're spinning? No, I just don't feel on balance. I feel off. That's disequilibrium, right? Then we have one of my favorite, oscillopsia. I just like the word. It's kind of like dysthetokinesia. Um, oscillopsia is a sensation that objects in the environment are moving and they're not really moving, right? So that'd be when I'm staring at this pen and I'm telling you stare at the pen, I'm not gonna move, I want you to focus on it. And for me, the pen's doing this. Like stop moving the pen, I'm not moving the pen, right? Um, that, do you ever have it where you're, you're not feeling very well in the car and you tell a person to stop the car and they stop the car, but to you, everything's still moving, right? The car is still moving. That's an oscillopsia event, right? When you're still seeing stuff kind of going by you. Really that kind of that flow of stuff going by you is really saccades, right? That's when you're, when you're looking out the window and you see stuff going, you know, you know, you know, you know, you're looking at those signposts that would be a saccades, right? Being able to focus and go from one car to another, right, is smooth pursuit. Anyway, I just happened to think of that when I was sitting here. 
So then we have to determine how long do the symptoms occur? What are they looking like? Are they acute? Right? Oh, look, you have acute dizziness. Isn't that sweet? No, acute dizziness is not acute. Not cute. It, it can be acute. Right? Is it chronic? Is it episodic, meaning that it comes and goes? Is it constant? Every time I get up, I just get sick. Okay. What makes it better or worse? Well, you know, in winter, I feel better. Hmm. So cold weather makes it feel better. Or usually it's the other way around. We'll say that in summer, I don't have the dizziness as much. Well, why would that be? Well, you got to think about it. Well, at that point, when it's warmer out, you're more likely to have that fluid in your ear be a little bit thinner, right? Because the heat kind of thins everything out. Hmm. Okay. When I lay down, I feel better. Okay. So when they're in a completely stable body state, stable head position, they're not dizzy. But anytime I move, man, it gets worse. Okay, good. That gives us stuff. It's breadcrumbs. We're starting to eat the breadcrumbs. We can run some tests. We can do a visual analog scale on a scale of zero to 10 with zero being, you know, nothing at all. I don't feel dizzy at all. To 10, oh my God, hand me a bucket. How would you rate your dizziness? How would you rate your lightheadedness? How would you rate your disequilibrium? What does it do to you? Oh, it's a 10 out of 10, just like everything else, right? My pain's 10 out of 10. My dizziness is a 10 out of 10. Let's go to the hospital. No, but it just kind of gives you a rating, right? And you can use that as kind of a subjective rating between visits because maybe they're a 10 out of 10 when you first see them, but three visits in, they're at a six. That's a huge change for a patient that suffers dizziness. It can be life altering. Uh, the dizziness handicap inventory, the DHI. It's a subjective measure of the patient's self-perceived handicap. It lets them tell you how bad the patient feels their symptoms are. There's the FDS, the functional disability scale, turns the patient's response to PT, right? It's administered before and after to give quantitative outcome results. Motion sensitivity quotient, subject to the patient's dizziness when placed in positions, right? So we're gonna put them in, sit upright. Okay, tilt your head. Okay, tilt your head. Okay, tilt your head. And then we're gonna have them kind of rate how their dizziness occurs when we do, okay, lay down on your right side. Okay, lay down on your left side. I just totally botched that. Hold on, lay down on my left side. Lay down on my right side. Right? So eye movements, this can be primary importance. We can use this to kind of help us localize their vestibular pathology, especially nystagmus. Nystagmus is the involuntary shaking or torsioning, which is known as twisting or turning. Twisting and turning, never mind. Um, I can't say, I know. Twisting or turning of the eyes when there shouldn't be, right? It's usually described on whether it beats, right? What, how does it move? Does it move to the head, beat upward, beat downward to the body, the beat left or right? Usually we don't talk about left or right because left or right can be kind of subjective. We usually talk about left eye upward nystagmus. That tells us the left eye is moving upwards, right? Because we usually use save left or right for describing the eye, but we will talk about geotrophic and ageotrophic. Geotrophic means if I have them laying on their left side and it's beating down to the ground and it's in their left eye, I could say they have a left eye geotrophic nystagmus, meaning that it's beating towards the earth. I don't usually use that if I see nystagmus when they're sitting up. When they're sitting up, it's either going to be up or down nystagmus because geotrophic save typically when they're laying on their sides. We need to observe it under ideal conditions, right? It's really hard to just stare at somebody's eyes. It's really creepy too, right? I'm staring into your eyes. Hold on. Are you staring at my eyes? I'm staring into your eyes. Let's see if you have nystagmus. Yeah, that's creepy, right? So we give them what's called frenzel lenses. They're these big lenses. And if you've ever seen Office Space, which is a fantastic movie, if you haven't seen it, must go see it, highly recommend it. But there's a guy in it named Milton. And Milton's got these really big, thick, thick, almost like my glasses, right? And even if you look at mine, when you see my, if I go from here without glasses to here with glasses, my eyes get much bigger in your sight, right? Friends of lenses are gonna blow that out of proportion. They're gonna, you're, the, uh, the actual eye is gonna become so big you can clearly watch their pupils, right? And you can see if they dilate can video record them, right? We've got cameras nowadays in our pockets, right? And a lot of a lot of clinics have taken to using, you know, really high, you know, I'm gonna say the, um, 
I was playing with somebody's new um, Samsung S20 Ultra or whatever I think it was, and I was messing with their camera on it. And man, like I was testing, I, I actually did a um, chair spin test, which we'll talk about. And I used that to record their eyes. And man, it was amazing how much I could catch in their eyes at like 4K or whatever. It's like, oh, this is just cool. You know, we used to have to pay thousands of dollars for a camera that can do this. And now it's in your pocket. And um, we can use infrared cameras, right? Because the eyes have different temperatures and that can help us figure it out. But we want to watch when we do techniques with them, do their eyes beat when they shouldn't, right? So if I turn my head like this, my eyes should come back if I'm focused in the middle, right? So if I'm focused here and I turn my head, right? I have that gain in phase. Well, if I turn my head like this and the eyes go to and then beat back, that's an astagmus. So one of the tests we'll run is the head thrust test. It's a widely used and accepted tool to measure semicircular canal function. If you look at this, it's got a sensitivity of 75 and the specificity of 85. What does that mean? Remember back to this. Spin and snout. I'm going to beat this into you until it's ruled out. Spin, SP, capital P, I, actually, let me, let's not use my writing tool. Let's actually use text tools, right? So SP and snout. Right? If the test is specific, it's got a high specificity and I get a positive result and rule it in. They probably have it. If it's sensitive and I get a negative, I can rule it out. Probably don't have. All right, so spin and snout. Got to remember that. So I've got a 0.75 and a 0.85 on specificity and sensitivity. What does this tell me? Well, it tells me that's a pretty good test. Right, so it tells me that if the patient's been negative before, and I did 100 tests of them, 75 are actually true negative tests, right? And the specificity of 80.85 tells me that, again, if I did 100 tests, 85 of the people that test positive are going to have the condition. Now, you're obviously going to have some of those rule, those that aren't going to. We have a couple of tests coming up that are actually even better than that. But that's the spin and snout rule. Remember, we talked about that. So the patient has to have functional cervical range of motion. This is important. You can't do a head thrust test if they've got a brace on. Ah, I can't thrust my head. Tests performed by having the patient fixate on near target. Usually what I'll do is I'll give them a target over my wall. So I have a, a bright red dot or something, or I'll give them the letter E if I have it to focus on over my shoulder. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take their head and rapidly twist it. High velocity, high amplitude thrusts, right? If I do that rapidly, their eye should move at the same speed. I should have that VOR gain working normal. I'm watching for the gain in the phase. In an abnormal response, it may take a corrective scotty and it may take or it may overshoot, right? So maybe I turn their head rapidly to the left and the eyes go or rapidly to the right and my eyes go all the way over here to the left and then come back. That would be an overshoot. And now that can tell me some things. Now I'm going to turn to the left, and that can help me determine that maybe I've got a left inner ear issue. It's a really, really good test to show that if I've got that and I see that the, I'm getting problems with my VR gain and phase, patient probably has something going on in their semicircular canals. Right now, if I don't get anything, it's perfect. The gain and phase is, you know, on point. It's a pretty good test that I don't have problems with my semicircular canals. I need to look elsewhere. I can do the head shaking nystagmus test or the HSN. Right, not home shopping network. And again, this is exactly like it sounds. I'm going to have my patient close their eyes and I'm going to flex and extend the head. I'm going to flex or extend the head either 30 degrees up or 30 degrees down. And then I'm going to take their head and I'm just going to rock it back and forth. 20 cycles at a frequency of two repetitions per second. I'm sure just saying that to some of you, you're going, I'm getting ready to vomit. Right. And do that rapidly, do, 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 20 cycles, count 20, stop, bring their head back to neutral and have them open their eyes, right? If they open their eyes, right, and I've got no nystagmus, 
right? That tells me that they don't have a positive head shaking nystagmus test. It means they're negative. Now look at this test though, right? This will rule in a unilateral peripheral vestibular defect, right? If they got a sensitivity, I rule. If I get a negative, it doesn't tell me much. 0.27 doesn't tell me anything. Got to find another test for that. If I get a positive at a 0.85, pretty good test. And then we have positional testings, right? That have commonly used to identify BPBV. We'll talk about that in a bit, right? The most common is the Dix Hall Pike or the Hall Pike Dix test, whichever you want to call it. It's a sensitivity of 0.95, specificity of 0.79. Again, pretty solid test. Patient is going to be moved from a sitting position with the head on rotated 45 degrees. So I'm going to rotate my head to 45 degrees to the side, right? And then you're going to go ahead and slide me down to my shoulder, keep the head rotated. And then you're going to have me roll onto my back. And then you're going to have my head extend back off the table, still keeping that 45 degrees. That's testing for a very specific canal. And you're watching for nystagmus in each of those positions. So when you move me 45 degrees, you're looking for nystagmus. When you lay me down on my side rapidly, you're looking for nystagmus. When you have me rolled on my back rapidly, you're looking for nystagmus. When you finally tilt my head back, you're looking for nystagmus. And again, can we perform this? Sure, this is actually can be performed by PTAs, but only after the PT's already done it. If you suspect the patient has a vestibular disorder, it doesn't mean you just start pulling out these tests and start doing them, right? That's not something we can do as PTAs. We can repeat the test to get additional results, but we just can't say, oh, I think this patient's got nystagmus. And I'll talk about a patient towards the end that kind of explains this, right? The dynamic visual acuity test, the measurement of visual acuity during horizontal motion of the head with static visual acuity of determined first. So what I'm gonna do is have them stare at a chart and read the eye chart to me, right? And then I'm gonna have them do stuff like turning the head to the left. Can you still read the eye chart? Can you still read what you're saying? Positional testing, commonly used, to identify a condition. Now, if I can't read it statically, having me do it dynamically is dumb because that's gonna tell you that I've got a problem, right? So you're gonna have me move horizontally. Look at this test, sensitivity 95, specificity 95. That is a pretty good test, right? This will tell us if one side's worse than the other. It's telling us, do we have that inhibitory cutoff, right? If I'm constantly rotating this side and I can't read, it tells me that I've got some problems, right? Again, we're not gonna interpret it. We're just gonna report patient had nystagmus, patient wasn't able to read. Don't care. We don't care why they have it. That's on the PT. Let them figure out the why. We just report what we see. We are not, you're not going to put that, you know, if you do the Dix Hall Pike and the patient has upbeating, you know, geotrophic torsional nystagmus, you're not going to say that patient has upbeating, ge uh, upbeating geotrophic nystagmus a feed and torsional geotrophic nystagmus to the left eye, which indicates that the patient has cupolithiasis in the left semicircular canal of the whatever. No, we are just going to put what we got. Patient had upbeating torsional geotrophic nystagmus dunzos on the left side. That's what we would put. So I want to make sure that you guys understand, even though I'm talking a lot of examination here and I'm talking a lot of diagnosis. We aren't the ones diagnosing it. This is what we're going to see when we look at the eval. Um, gait and balance testing. Table 21.4 and page 930 on your book tells you a bunch of different ones. We have the Romberg, we have the tandem Romberg where you've got the feet offset, single leg stance, normalized gait, gait with head rotation. There's that stork test we talked about before. Some vestibular function tests we can run. Caloric testing. If you do caloric testing, I'm going to tell you now, your, your PT says we're going to run a caloric test on this patient, get a bucket. This one is the one that is probably the one that I've seen, again, so much puke, so much puke. This is one I will tell you that I've seen a lot of patients puke on. What you're going to do is you're going to fill the uh, external auditory meatus with warm air or warm water or cold air or cold water. It changes the temperature gradient and that ver therefore changes that connective flow of the endolymph. And it can generate nystagmus just from it. It can generate the feeling vertigo. So you're going to have maybe them lay down on their left side and you're going to pour some, not hot water, you don't want to cook the inside of the inner ear, right? But you're going to pour some warm to moderately hot water into their ear. 
and you're going to have them report their symptoms and you're going to watch for nystagmus and they're like also they're like i vomit the room is spinning note it down give them a can right now we put cold water in there and they have no change that can tell us stuff that can be really beneficial to the pt to determine what might be their root cause is it the cupola, is it the ampulla? Is it the semicircular canals? What's causing it? The rotary chair test, I think, is the meanest one. You guys did this in elementary school and didn't even realize you were doing a physical therapy test. You're going to have the patient sit in a chair in a dark room and you're going to spin around the chair. Right? So a normal vestibular function results from nystagmus generated by the rotations, meaning your head's going to be. If I'm spinning to the right, my nystagmus is going to go the opposite direction, right? We can then also measure gain and phase off of it and compare those normal values that we have, right? So if you spin me to the right and I'm getting nystagmus to the right, you know that something's going on on my left side, probably. Autolith tests, right? There's all kinds of these. There's much more advanced tests, the VEMP, the SVV, the SVH. I'm not going to go over those because those are well above our pay grade, honestly. Now, if you're in a vestibular clinic, you might be experienced in treating these, but there is absolutely no way if your PT says, did you learn how to do the VEMP in school? Nope. That's not something a general PTA coming out needs to know. I'd be glad to learn it, but that's not something that's specific, right? You know, it's like anything else. You guys are coming out as generalized PTs or PTAs, I'm sorry. You're not expected to know something like spinal mobilizations. Is it neat to learn stuff like that? Sure. Is it within our scope of practice? That's kind of questionable. Right now, if you know, I've been if I'm been treating for you know neuro patients or vestibular patients for 20 years, and I've done 50,000 VEMPs, sure, that's within my scope of practice at that point. I, if your PT is okay with it, right? But you're not going to do this as a new grad PT, you've got to kind of learn how to do these things. You got to take those continuing education courses and learn. If you want to, if you want to do some of this cool stuff, you got to learn. So we're going to talk about some PNS pathologies. We can have mechanical and decreased receptor input. Those are the two main things. So mechanical, typically the most common is BPV. We'll go over that's going to be the big one we're going to hit in a few minutes here. The symptoms typically include vertigo with any head movement and is usually brief duration. So they'll say that my symptoms get really bad when I get out of bed. And then as I sit or stand up for a while, it gets better. You know, it may have nausea and vomiting or may have nausea without vomiting and the general feeling of off balance, right? Uh, I get sick when I roll over on my right side. I get sick when I sit up. I get sick when I stand up, but then it gets better usually a sign that there's a problem with semicircular canals and it's a mechanical problem with that endolymph. Decreased receptor input means now something's happening with my inner ear. The neuro function is going down. I can have a unilateral or a bilateral vestibular hypofunction test. Um, I'm never going to have a trilateral vestibular hypofunction test because I don't have three ears and if I have three ears that's pretty cool have an ear right on your forehead, right? But bilateral vestibular hypofunction test or unilateral hypofunction test, right? Unilateral means one of my ears is messed up. Bilateral means both. Unilaterals usually come from viral insults, trauma, vascular events, we'll talk about them. Symptoms include vertigo, spontaneous nystagmus, meaning it just happens. Oscillopsia with head movement. So if I turn my head, things tend to move in the environment on me. Postural instability and disequilibrium. Bilateral vestibular hypofunction, both my ears are now messed up. What does that usually cause? Autotoxicity. That's the major one that causes it. It can be CVAs and TIAs as well, right? Um, but autotoxicity is the big one where I get a, an infection like meningitis, bacterial meningitis, and they give me broad spectrum antibiotics. And those broad spectrum antibiotics mess up my inner ear. It's aminoglycoside antibiotics that are the big ones. So any of the ones that ends in the myosins. So kenamycin, genomycin. Genomycin is the big one. You know, streptomycin, erythromycin. Now, I usually have at least one of you guys, and you're not here to ask me this, but I usually have one of you go, well, you know, I can't take penicillin. So they give me erythromycin. Does that mean I'm going to have my inner ears messed up? No. Right? 
we're talking large boluses of these antibiotics usually cause it. So this is usually a patient that comes in and they've got bacterial meningitis and they're worried about them you know, dying. So they'll give them a huge dosage of the myosins because the myosins are really good at treating bacterial meningitis. Or maybe they're not sure if it's bacterial or viral and it turns out it's viral and they give them antibiotics. It can mess up their inner ear, right? And they can become permanently disabled from it. A lot of times bilateral vestibular hypofunction patients, they're often called wobblers, right? Because they've got disequilibrium, oscillopsia, gait ataxia, right? I'll talk about, a, when we get to bilateral hypofunction, I've got an interesting story about them as well. The key thing with the bilateral is there's usually no non-zero vertigo. It, they just are off balance at all times and their gait is very ataxic. So CNS, what can cause this? Well, a CVA, right? Typically involving the anterior inferior cerebellar artery or the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, which help provide feeds to that inner ear, right? Can also cause problems with the vertebral artery, right? Sometimes vertebral artery will cause some vertigo issues. Table 21.5, which I have copied the bottom, has some common associated CNS versus PNS symptoms. So I would, you know, this would be something good, that table at least would be something good to maybe take and print out and put in your binder because that gives you a clear thing that if the ataxia is severe, right, it's probably CNS related. If it's mild, it's PNS related. It gives you a really good kind of goal. Now, does that mean that this is 100% true, that, you know, no patient that has acute vertigo uh, is not there, that's, that they're always peripheral? Not necessarily. So it's not 100%, but it's a really good route, right? It's like the CVAs we talked about, right? CVAs aren't always presenting the way they are, but most of them present that way. So this is a really, really good chart to put in your clinical binder. So BPBV, right? What does that mean? Benign, which means non-tumor causing, not harmful in effect. But I'm going to tell you, patients don't like that it's called benign because they would disagree that it's benign. Right? They don't think that's harmful. If you think that it's not harmful to those patients, they think it's harmful, right? But it's not cancerous, right? It's not tumor causing. Proximal, not proximal, P-R-O-X-I-M-A-L, meaning closer to the body. Paroximal, meaning sudden onset and sudden resolving, right? Positional, I should be able to explain that. You should understand that. And vertigo, feeling that things are moving, right? That's what BPBV stands for. What are our goals for it? We're gonna get the autoconia to the vestibule and get it out of the system. The vestibule, think of it as a trash can, right? Patient will demonstrate reduced vertigo associated with head motion. Patient will have demonstrated improved balance. Patient will demonstrate enhanced decision-making skills regarding self-treatments means they're gonna do HEPs and they're gonna to listen to not laying on their right side for a long period of time. Right? And the patient will demonstrate better independence with basic ADLs and IADLs, right? meaning that they were now going to stop keeping their head nice and tight. And you'll see this with patients that have BPVV, or even when you get the bilateral function happens as well. The patient becomes very rigid, and they don't want to move their head. So instead of turning their head, they'll turn their whole body to move, right? Now, that can happen to people that have no neck too, right? I'm not going to turn my head because I have no neck to turn my head. No, I'm just kidding. Right? But they become very rigid and I'm moving like this instead of turning my head. Well, why would I do that? Well, because every time I turn my head, I get dizzy. So I'm gonna avoid turning my head, right? So what can cause BPV? Head trauma is one of the major ones I've seen, blows to the head, uh, sudden acceleration or deceleration of the head, car accidents, right? Inner ear disease can cause it, especially if it's degenerative inner ear disease, labyrinthitis, Vestibular neuritis can cause it. Uh, Schemic events, blood flow being cut off. Sometimes it's just idiopathic, right? Meaning we don't know why it happened. Had patients that come in, they've got BPV, we've got a clear sign of BPV. And you're like, well, what did you do to cause this? And they're like, I haven't done anything. You know, maybe that they just laid on their left side once and it caused it. It's idiopathic. Meniere's disease, which we'll talk about, is a, it's also a contraindication, but Meniere's disease can lead to BPVV. Um, bilateral incomplete autotoxicity, meaning that you've had that autotoxicity, but it's not enough to lead to unilateral or bilateral hypofunction. Stapedectomy, where they go in and remove the stapes. 
there can be genetic components to BPD. So if you've got a family member, specifically mom, dad, brother, sister, that suffer from BPV, there's some connection to you probably having BPV as well. Um, osteopenia, osteoporosis makes sense, if the, especially if the inner ear bones are breaking down or the bony labyrinth. And then prolonged ear dependency, meaning that they laid on one side for a long period of time. Uh, we're starting to see patients coming out of the COVID cycle with BPVV because a lot of them are laying prone because they're finding it's the best pay way for the patients to lay. And all those stones are kind of moving away from the vestibule and they're just sitting in there. And then we sit the patient up and they're like, oh my God, I'm gonna vomit. Right? Complaints. Well, bed movement mobility causes it. Reaching for objects in the floor, under the cupboard, top of the cupboard, they usually call this top shelf syndrome. I saw it a lot with um, in this area with patients that were bartenders, right? Where they'd say that I'm, I'm good when I'm working here. But when I reach for that stuff up top there, that's when I get dizzy. Well, why is that? Well, their head moves in that direction. So if you get that diagonal movement, you've definitely got those semicircular canals working. Um, working under a car, mechanics, right? Swimming, diving, right? Diving especially because you're going to change the pressures in your ear. Changing a light bulb. Well, why? This. Right? That's one of the positions we put patients in in order to evoke it. Uh, dental chairs, getting patients their teeth cleaned, right? And this can be a really good benefit here. If you if you're got a BPV clinic that's treating it, reach out to dental clinics. Say, hey, if you have a patient that comes in and complains about getting dizzy when they're having their teeth cleaned, send them to me. I'll send you people that need dental work because we're going to encounter that. Trust me. Oh, God, some of those people's breath. Um, diagnostic procedures involving head dependency, right? Where they're locked in a specific position, CT, MRI, surgery, something of that effect. This chart is really good to know if you're going to work in specific vestibular treatment centers. I am not going to make you have to memorize that if the beating is up beating and right torsional and if that is nystagmus that it's going to be cupelotheosis versus cantalotheosis. I'm not asking that. We're gonna talk about what cupola and cantalotheosis is coming up in a bit. But you're going to a vestibular clinic, put this into your binder. Please put this into your binder. Please have a binder. So cupelotheosis is the first one, right? It's a condition where the debris gets stuck to the cupola right, of the semicircular canal, rather than being loose within the canal. The canal now becomes gravity sensitive, which is not the normal function of semicircular canals. So when we change the position of gravity itself with the head, it creates a feeling of uneasiness, right? Cupelotheosis usually results in a constant nystagmus. It may occur in any canal, because you've got cupolas in all of them, right? Each of them may have its own pattern and positional nystagmus. There's not a real controlled study for this to indicate what strategy is best. A lot of times we kind of try everything approach. You know, we'll try, we'll try this position, we'll try this treatment, we'll try that treatment, we'll try Brant Darhoff. And it resolves and we're like, yay, well, which one worked? All of them. And if you ask a patient, they don't care what exercise you're doing with them. If they resolve this problem, that's all they care about. So cupola theasis, debris stuck to the cupola, right? Uh, characteristics, immediate onset of vertigo and nystagmus when they try to move around and it resolves, right? But the symptoms last for a long period of time and then decays, meaning maybe you see that nystagmus and it's a really strong, nice beating nystagmus and then it kind of slows down, slows down. You're asking the patient, how are you feeling? I'm starting to feel better, I'm starting to feel better. Okay, now it's starting to feel better. Okay, good, I'm getting it. Okay, good, I feel much better. It can be a central sign in some instances, meaning patients could, could be a problem with that vestibular nerve sending signals, especially in patients with MS. So we have to try treating them for cupola theosis. And if it doesn't work, we may have to refer them out. And again, referring them out as a PT. We can talk to PT and say, hey, look, we've been seeing this patient for nine weeks for cupola theosis and it's not working. What can we do? Can we send them off to get some testing? Oh, sure. Canalotheosis. This is where the stones become stuck in the canals. This is one of the more common ones. Now you've got free-floating debris, right? Detrius, just debris, 
floating in the semicircular canals. The Otoconia and Stratoconia become abnormal and cause abnormal endolymphatic flow, and that causes the patient, the cupola to artificially fire. So stuff gets deflected the wrong way. A lot of times, when you have a patient that's got canalithiasis, there's a delay in the motion to symptoms. So they turn their head rapidly, they're fine. And then three to five seconds later, sometimes it could be 20 seconds, like I said, um, be patient with your patient, but they turn their head rapidly and all of a sudden they're like, how do you feel? I'm like, I feel okay, I feel okay. <clears throat> right, all of a sudden I feel vertigo, right? So, and then we're gonna follow and watch the latency. How long does it take to resolve? So when we're talking about canalithiasis, we have three different types we can have. What makes sense is gonna follow the canals. We have posterior, lateral, and anterior. Canal lithiasis, canal lithiasis, right? So most common, posterior canal is by far the most common. It usually occurs the blows to the head, right? Just because blows to the head cause those parts of the stones to break off the most frequently or repeated long-term positioning. Um, patients that have strokes and stuff like that are common. I've got a kid that I'll talk about that with. Next most common is lateral, right? And usually lateral happen because of a messed up epley. We're gonna talk about the epley or the cannula three positioning maneuver. We screw up doing the cannula three positioning maneuver and we move it from a posterior canal into the lateral canal. Well, you'll hear a lot of times when you're talking to PTs and PTAs that work in vestibular about threading the needle. And what they're talking about is getting those stones to move through the right canals to get to that vestibule and get out of there. Anterior canals, less common, right? And why is that? Well, because it just doesn't happen very commonly in the anterior canal. Uh, and usually if it does, it's just from positional, you know, maybe making up for the Dix Hall Pike screwing it up. It's diagnosed with the Dix Hall Pike, but very rarely does it occur. I can't tell you I've had an anterior canal patient. I have had posterior, I have had lateral, but I can't tell you honestly, I've had it. I know that um, Dr. Mortensen, who we deal with pretty frequently down at the um, at physical, I know he's dealt with it, but it's not something I've really encountered. Uh, just, it's just not common. Utricular, utriculotheosis. Well, this makes sense because now the stone is getting stuck on the utricle. Nice thing it tells you which they are, right? It's a rare but possible phenomenon where the otoconia, once in the otolith, falls into the utricle side of the ampulla, causing cupolithiasis effect. Right? So now instead of getting stuck on one side, it gets stuck on the other. Well, now we've got, oh yeah, right? We've got it stuck on that side. Now we've got to figure out how to get it out of there. Right? So we've got to go thread the needle the whole way through. And usually we're gonna to have to go the whole way through all the canals until we can get to that vestibule. And the patient doesn't understand why we're doing so many techniques. Well, that's the only way we can get that back to the trash can. Vestibular lithiasis. This is a theoretical condition where the debris is present on the vestibule side of the cupula rather than being on the canal side, meaning that it's in the trash can, but it's stuck to the trash can. So you can almost think of this like a rim shot. You get it to the rim and for whatever reason, it gets up there on the rim of the basketball and just sits there, right? You did so well, right? There's loose debris close but unattached to the cupola of the posterior canal, possibly in the vestibule, stuck on the short arm of the semicircular canal it would often resemble cupulothiasis, and we've had patients, there's been patients that have been theoretically prescribed or said they have this, but it's one of the ones that's still being researched. But the intermittency may be because the debris is movable, so it's going into the trash can and coming out of the trash can. Very little data, data is available to the frequency of this, and actually a lot of data is not available to most of this. But what we're going to do is we're going to try that, you know, gunshot method, try it and see if we can fix it. So what kind of testing can we do for this? <clears throat> Excuse me. What you'll find a lot of times, is sometimes by doing the testing, I, that's why I put testing in quotes, sometimes by doing the testing, we actually solve the problem. It's funny. I've had a patient where the PT does the Dick's Hall Pipe test. And because they did the Dick's Hall Pipe, the stone moves into the vestibule and is thrown into the trash can. And the patient's all of a sudden like, Oh my God, what did you just do? It's my dizziness is completely gone. And they have to move around and do stuff and they're like jumping up for joy and they're happy. Well, because Dix Hall Pike looks a lot like some of the treatments we do. Right? Dix Hall Pike, we're going to look to see that's going to be our major test to see if we have vertical canal 
posterior anterior type movements and can reveal some horizontal canal involvement as well based upon the nystagmus. There's the Pagnini, uh, which is also known as the roll test. There's sideline tests, there's two different variants. There's the bow and lean test. What we're gonna find here in a little bit, I'm gonna show you, we have a bunch of different tests, but here's the interesting thing. The tests and the treatments, we're adapting every day. So I love this one down here, make up your own test. Maybe you'll become famous. Maybe five years from now, I'll be doing, you know, I, I don't know, I'll, I'll be doing the Erica special maneuver for BPV. Okay, great, right? But we do have some kind of standard treatments. We have the CRM or the canalith repositioning maneuver, often known as the Epley, right? And I have the pictures coming up with this. This, this is where we kind of move the patient head through a specific position to sequence and thread that needle, get the debris out of the semicircular canal, get it into the vestibule. Once the debris is in the vestibule, the signs and symptoms should resolve. Here's the key thing, aftercare. Usually after they have had the CRM done in a clinic, a lot of times we're gonna put on that soft kind of Philadelphia collar as a reminder to keep a nice vertical head position and they have to sleep upright for two days or until the symptoms resolve. So we're gonna ask them, okay, so on Monday we do the test. I don't want you to sleep lying down until Wednesday when you come back and see me. So they gotta sit up or sleep upright. They gotta get in a recliner for 48 hours. And a lot of patients mess this stuff because they'll go back to laying down in bed and what we'll find out is that's what caused it in the first place. And so now they go back to lying down on bed and they're right back to where they started, right? So it's really important. And honestly, with most of these activities, except for the Brandt Darhoff, which are home exercise programs with the liberatory maneuver as well. And with some of the other ones, a lot of times we're gonna say, I need you to sleep upright for two days, at least two days, just so that we don't cause a recurrence of your problem. The liberatory maneuver is a cupola theasis problem when it's stuck to the cupola. Liberatory, I also call this the bang maneuver because you're gonna bang them off of the table in order to bang that stuff off of the um, inner ear. I'll just, I'll wait to get the maneuvers you'll see. It's very effective, but it's often difficult for patients to tolerate because it is a violent maneuver. And a lot of times, again, this is gonna be one that <laughs> blown chunks. Brant Darhoff is habituation in the CNS to provoke positions. So we're gonna basically have them move through a lot of the Dix Hall pipe positions in a lot of the CRM positions and stay there for a few minutes each time, perform five to 10 reps three times a day. And they're gonna do that until no vertigo occurs for two consecutive days. They need to do this repetitively three times a day. And you'll tell them, I know this, this stuff's hard to do, but here's the deal. You've been dealing with this for so long. I need you to work at it too. So there's the Gufani, there's the modified Gufani, there's the Gans, there's the Venucci, there's the half somersault maneuver. But the key thing here, I'm not gonna go over any of those. Key thing here is maybe you'll be able to develop a test and treatment for your own. Great, if you do, right? Please come back and tell me if you ever do. So here's the canalith repositioning maneuver. So looking at this one here, the piece of stuff is stuck into that posterior canal and we're gonna roll them through. And that's what, if you can see, threading the needle till we get it down into that vestibule and into the trash can. This little one down here in the corner is just kind of a seated version or a lying down gentle version of doing this. So if you look, you're gonna turn their head to one side, they're gonna lay waist straight back. We're gonna rotate their head to the other side. They're gonna roll to that side and then they're gonna sit up and move through that whole thing. Right, that's the canelith repositioning maneuver. Again, if you go to a PT clinic that does this, please don't be so worried. This, I, I don't know how to do this fully. You know, I'll, I'll post some videos of this. We'll talk about it briefly when I'll, I'll demonstrate when we have the lab as well. But this is a specialized technique, guys. Don't totally freak out that you have to know this. You have to know what it is, right? A lot of the stuff, your boards are gonna require you to know what it is, know it didactically, and then be trained on it in the clinic. The Samant maneuver, here it is. That's what I learned it as. Now the liberatory maneuver because we're taking names off of it. At this point, I'm gonna have the patient turn away from the way I'm going. And literally what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a hold of them and I am literally gonna bounce them off the table. I'm gonna just bang it down hard. And the goal is if I hit hard enough and cause enough of a jar, that piece of stuff stuck on the canal is gonna break loose. 
right? And I'm gonna hiss at them up and then I'm gonna go the other direction, bang. And I'm gonna bang, bang. And so my story about this was I had a kid once, um, this was back when I was in Pennsylvania. I don't remember if I've told this story or not. I've told so many stories I can't remember at this point. A little kid, he was, um, five five it was young he had to be older than that maybe six seven but he was in the pediatric wing of the hospital and we were seeing him because he was severely deconditioned he'd been in the hospital for some odd like 30 days or something like that we couldn't figure out what was wrong with him he initially came in because he was riding his bike and he was jumping his bike and when he jumped his bike he wrecked and when he jumped his bike and wrecked he tore open his knee pretty bad so they you know, they had to do stitches on his knee. They treated that. And then they thought he might've had a bacterial infection. They thought this, they thought that. Could not figure out what was wrong with his kid. So one of his symptoms, every time he moved, he screamed. Oh, it didn't help that this kid was nonverbal. So anytime we moved him in any direction, we rolled him over, we sat him up, we did anything with him. He screamed like a banshee. And there was a note on the card that says, bring sound reduction earphones or earplugs. And I was like, yeah, it can't be that bad. And the nurse, as soon as I went to see him, she's like, yeah, you can see him, close the door. Can't be that bad. Man, this kid, I've never heard a kid scream like this kid. And what I was doing was I was trying to get him to sit up for 15 minutes because he spent so much time lying down in just the kind of like a fetal position. And so I'm like, okay, come on. I need you to sit up. I need you to sit up. I need you to sit up, buddy. And he was thrown up, of course. But then they were like, oh, he's probably thrown up because he's got a viral infection, right? Or he's got bacterial infection. That's what's causing this. This is all, all an infection of the brain. This is all this and all that. And I mean, he had all the hallmark signs of an infection. I mean, his wound was kind of red, you know, but he's a kid too. Is he picking at it? It was one of those. So this is my first time treating him. And I get him rolled to his side. He's screaming bloody murder, calms down. And then I sit him up and he screams bloody murder. But when he screams bloody murder, his eyes are like this big, you know, like talking like cartoon sized. And I'm watching it and all of a sudden I see nystagmus. And now granted, I had not treated a lot of vestibular patients at that point, but I remember back we had a vestibular specialist to come in and say, hey, vestibular issues here. Um, and the way his nystagmus went, it was definitely cupolithiasis. And I'm like, oh, oh, did I just, did I just solve this? It'd be really cool if I did. And then I'm like, okay, well, I want to try doing the samat on him. Well, actually, first of all, what he does, I sat him, laid him down, I sat him back up, and I laid him down, and I sat him back up, like three times to confirm that I saw what I saw. My ears rooms were blown out at that point. And so I said to mom, hey, mom, I want to have something done real quick. I need to get my PT. Can you hold on for a few minutes? Because I actually want you here for this. And sure enough, I called over the PT. I said, get, I need you to come over here. We missed this. And the PT was like, okay. And I got the PT that was on for the weekend comes running over. And I said, I really think they have cupolithiasis. And the PT looks at me and goes, cupola what? And I'm like, cupolithiasis, where the stones get stuck on the cupola. And my PD's like, yeah, I learned that like 40 years ago. I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm like, well, let me show you. So I showed the PT. I said, look, nystagmus. I said, can you adjust the eval so we can do some repositioning maneuvers? And the PT's like, well, is it going to hurt the kid? No, it's not going to hurt the kid. It may solve the problem. It may not. What's the worst that's going to happen? It's going to scream bloody murder. We've been doing that to him all this whole time. And she's like, yeah. She's like, but I have to stay here for this, the first treatment. She goes, I don't know what I'm doing. So guess who's going to do it? Good luck. I'm going to be here with you. Like, okay, I need you to hold this trash can because this kid's going to puke. And sure enough, I did the, the Samat maneuver on him. So I, I said, mom, I said, I know this is going to look bad. He's going to scream. He's going to throw up. He's going to be mad at us. I said, I need you to stay with me. If you can't be through this, I said, I need you to step out in the hallway. And she's like, no, I'll be with you. So I got him sitting up. I turned his head and I literally just wham, slammed him down in the, I remember the bed. Blank. And sure enough, I slammed him down to the one side and it was a vomit comet. 
come out of his mouth. The P got all over the PT. It was fantastic. So I warned the PT to hold it in front of them and try to avoid his face, but nope, it yeah, splattered all over the PT. And then I did the other side, bang. And then magically we sat up and he sat up and he wasn't crying. Like literally just sat there for a good 30 seconds and wasn't crying. And then the mom started crying because he was sitting there. And what it was is he had a huge chunk of autoconia that was stuck on his inner ear. And what did they had done? Well, they thought he had an they thought he had an infection. So they gave him broad spectrum antibiotics. So they probably caused autotoxicity too. So he did have some unilateral hypofunction going on. Uh, actually, bilateral hypofunction. So, and he had been laying down, so they were already not functioning very well to begin with. But we got that autoconia loose and got it into the vestibule. And sure enough, man, as soon as we did that, he was, I mean, it wasn't right as rain because he'd been lying down for three months or something crazy like that. So now he's completely deconditioned, but we'd gotten that down. Well, he couldn't tell us he was dizzy. He was nonverbal. That was his way of telling us he's dizzy. I'm screaming bloody murder. Why don't, why don't you understand what I'm saying? Right. And, you know, I saw him an inpatient and then I saw him about six months later. I didn't see him. He was coming, he was coming to our pediatric wing when I worked there for outpatient therapy. And he was coming for gait training to relearn how to walk, but he was upright and he wasn't screaming anymore. And it was just such an amazing feeling that Something as simple as that solved it. And I remember the ENT coming over and talking to me, the ear, nose, and throat doctor. And he's like, I didn't think to look for that. And I'm like, I didn't think to look for it either, to be 100%. I wasn't looking for it. It just was one of those spontaneous things. But it was just so great that literally that one treatment changed his whole function. And he, he had to go to therapy for like nine or 12 months after it to get all of his normal arm strength back, leg strength back, walking, teaching him how to do stuff like that. But he could get it back because now he wasn't dizzy every time he did it. When we found out that, you know, that I guess mom went and watched the security footage or something of it, he banged his head when he smashed his knee. And that was what caused it. But because he was nonverbal, he couldn't tell us he banged his head. Right? So it's kind of wild. That's one of my fun stories with that. Here's the brand Darhoff. All it is is we're moving them through the Samant and the, the uh, the uh, um, canelith repositioning mover, they're just doing it at home on their own. This is the canelith repositioning Omniac chair, as you can see, <laughs> they've got a bag in their lap. So this allows them to watch their eyes. You can see over here on the monitor that the, the glasses are showing their eyes on the screen over here. And this is literally going to roll them through all of those maneuvers and spin them in circles. And they can do the Saman, it can do the, the, the barbecue lama, uh, Lembert, I think is the one, where it rolls them completely upside down. So that chair is really kind of violent and patients really don't like it, but it does make them feel better. If a patient has UVH, unilateral vestibular, so we're moving away from BPV and now talking about what happens if I've got a problem with just one of my inner ears, right? Here's the goals that should be there. The main thing is patient's recovery time for unilateral hypofunction is about six to eight weeks. It may also be never how bad it is. So we have to be aware of that. You know, when we have unilateral and bilateral hypofunction, they may never get better. So we're going to work on gaze stability, right? We're going to try to improve the vestibular ocular reflex. We're also going to work on a little bit of habituation with this patient to get their gaze normalized. So we're going to do vestibular adaption devices where we're improving retinal slip, meaning the motion of that eye, the visual image on the retina. And we usually use paradigms. We have two primary paradigms and a third paradigm as well. We have the VOR exercises. So we have VOR1. VOR1, you're going to take one object. They're going to focus on it, right? The head is moved either horizontally, vertically, or diagonally as quickly as possible, as long as the patient can maintain focus and their eyes don't leave the object. So we're going to start really small, right? Slower, large amplitude motions first. Right. And then as they get better, they can increase the speed and they're going to increase it until they can't maintain focus on it anymore. Okay, I lost focus, so I got to slow it down. Right. That's VOR1. VOR2 is two motions. VOR2, two motions. 
the head and the target are going to move in opposite directions. So as I turn my head to the left or the right, my target moves to the left. A lot of times VOR2 is hard for a patient to do on their own, so they may want to have somebody helping them with it. I really like using a highlighter for this type of stuff because highlighters are big and kind of bold and it helps them really focus on it. Then you have VRX, VRXC. There's a couple different terms for it, which is VOR cancel. The target is focused on the body is moved side to side. So now instead of my head doing this, now I'm going to rotate my body. And I'm going to focus on that object. It's really hard for me to do that in this chair, right? The paradigm should be made increasingly more difficult as the patient improves. Well, how do we make them more difficult? Well, we increase the, the variation of change. So we're increasing the range of motion. We increase the speed. We may decrease the size of an object. So we may go down from a big thick highlighter down to a pen like this. Um, we can focus on a dot on the wall. We can have them read while they're doing it, right? The key thing here is they have to maintain focus. When they get to the point that they're losing focus, they have to stop, refocus, and restart the exercises. Um, if you're somebody that already has some issues with kind of, you know, you get dizzy when you're moving stuff, maybe you try this. See if doing these a couple of times, if over time it gets your dizziness better, right? I'm not gonna diagnose you, I'm not treating you, right? We're gonna work on postural stability. Right? The objective of these exercises is to improve balance by encouraging the patient to develop normal balance strategies. We're incorporate head movement into exercises. So we're gonna have them do normal type exercises and have them move their heads while they're doing it. Utilizing proprioceptive input as much as possible and be aware of those proprioceptive deficits. So we're gonna start compensating for visual problems by using proprioception. Gonna pay attention to motion sensitivity, right? We're going to try to habituate the training to reduce the response of continual dizziness by repeating or doing movements over and over again. So if we know that they get dizzy every time they turn to the left, the right, well, guess what we're going to do? We're going to work a lot going to the right to work on that dizziness. So we get it habituated, get it back to normal. Bilateral. Well, here's the goals for it. The main thing here is bilateral patients to understand that it may be two years or never again for this. Excuse me. So treatments. Well, patients with bilateral vestibular hyperfunctions, we're going to do this gaze, uh, gaze stability. Back to those VRRs. Equilibrium training, postural stability, gait. We're going to use exercise that incorporate sequenced eye and head movements. Maybe the use of an imaginary target. We may have them doing sidestepping drills while watching something go around the window, right? Walking is the big thing and it should be done daily as much as possible. Walking in different surfaces and in different environments to increase their proprioceptive input to overcome that VOR loss, right? So now think about it. With unilateral hypofunction, there's a vestibular ocular cutoff, vestibular ocular reflex, cut off just one side. With bilateral hip function, now both sides are ineffective. So with unilateral, we're going to try to improve this side by starting also to rely more on that left side. If we have bilateral, the only thing we can do is try to improve that function, but then compensate for the loss. Tai Chi is great for this. Exercises in water. Water training for patients that have bilateral vestibular hip function is really big because if they fall, they just kind of fall into the water. Hopefully they can swim, right? We're going to work on adaption exercises. Walking in the dark is big. Night driving, right? Sports requiring quick movements of the head may be limited when they're at this, right? If you get somebody that's got bilateral hyperfunction, you know, playing dodgeball may not be the best option for them. All right, central vestibular hyperfunction, meaning that we're starting to have a problem with the transmission from the vestibular system to the central nervous system. Main things we're going to work on is fall prevention because they're going to fall and work on safety precaution. We may have to give them assistive devices, teach compensatory story training, right? Patient will be independent of performing their HEPs, which includes walking. Treatment may be choose by an accurate diagnosis. If we have central vestibular hypofunction, this is one that's gonna take some time to diagnose right. And it, this one may be one that's, again, may be incomplete, but the vestibular rehabilitation program offers a promise for treating patients with this, right? The idea here with that kind of the cutoff between the brain and the vestibular system is can we compensate for it 
and teach them how to habituate, get back to a level where they can actually invite and work in the environment. Um, bilateral hypofunction I mentioned before was wobbler syndrome, right? Because that the ears are not spiking like they should, right? There was a whole article, and again, I, I've talked about this book, but the brain that changes itself, right? There's a whole group of people from, I think the early eighties that were called the wobblers because they were given mass doses that, you know, we used to give antibiotics out like candy and it burn out the vestibular systems. Um, and this one guy was developing a technique where instead of relying on their inner ears for balance, they relied on their tongue. So they had this little electrode in their tongue that when they tilted their head, because when they tilted their head, it changed the shape of their mouth, the tongue would fire on that side and would tell them they have to tilt their head back to the center. And then they would fire and tell them. And what they found was the person started compensating for balance by using their tongue. And so they started giving these patients the treatment and it would improve them for a short periods of time. So they would do the treatment and then maybe for a couple hours afterwards, they'd be good for balance. They didn't have to keep the electrode on their tongue any longer for a couple hours afterwards. What they found is the more and more these people came for it, the longer that treatment lasted. It was really wild. We had latent pathways in their brain that allowed them to now use their tongue for balance. Again, that's neuroplasticity. It's just so cool to me, right? Uh, they may complain of dizziness starting off with habituation exercises, but just remember, if they start complaining, we got to back off a little bit because if we go too aggressive, we'll aggravate their condition and we don't want to do that. And we're going to incorporate gait and balance exercises, working on somatosensory techniques. So walk on different feeling devices, maybe putting different shoes on, heavier shoes, lighter shoes changing the way they look at things, maybe giving them glasses that knock out certain colors, right? Maybe giving them dark glasses when it's daylight out to see what happens with their vision. So other diagnoses that may involve the vestibular system. We talked about Meniere's. Meniere's is a low frequency hearing loss and episodic, episodic vertigo issue. The patient may complain of a sense of fullness in the ear and tinnitus ringing in their ears. This is a problem where the, again, we're starting to go towards that unilateral bilateral hypofunction, right? There's an infection in their ear and it's affecting their whole inner ear. Uh, maybe caused by those aminoglycoside antibiotics, genomycin, streptomycin, right? Here's the deal. If you have a patient that starts complaining about, oh my God, it feels my, I've got pressure in my ear and I've got ringing, stop treatment. That is a contraindication, get the PT. That means they probably are positive for Meniere's. Perilymphatic fistula is a rupture of the oval or around windows of the ear, right? The membranes that separate the middle and the inner ear out. The result is usually vertigo with hearing loss. So if you have a patient that you know, talks about, I just can't hear out of my left ear, that may be a perilymphatic fistula and they may have to go in and look at it from the ear, nose and throat specialist. Acoustic neuroma or vestibular schwannoma is a benign tumor located on the cranial nerve. And it'll include complaints of progressive hearing loss, tinnitus, and disequilibrium. If they have an acoustic neuroma, there's not much we're going to be able to do. We're probably going to still see them, but we're going to work on habituation. If they've got problems when they lean to the right, well, guess what we're going to do? We're going to a lot of lean to the right and safety lean to the right. We're going to habituate them. Vestibular neuritis is the second most common disorder of the vestibular system, second only to BPVV. It's inflammation of the vestibular nerve, vestibular nerve neuritis. The condition chiefly affects adults between the ages of 20 or 30 and 50 without preference for sex. Um, the attacks are often spontaneous vertigo lasting hours to days to slowly taper off to persistent imbalance. It's a viral insult to the vestibular cochlear nerve, usually preceded by an upper respiratory infection, a URI. Well, why would this be? So if I get a respiratory infection in this, my mouth, nose, and pharynx region, how could that affect my inner ear? Well, I've got the eustachian tube. Right? And the eustachian tube, that virus can creep and just, do, 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 I'm going to take a vacation up here in the inner ear, right? And a lot of times what it is, is the URI triggers a latent HSV infection. So HSV loves to hide in places and canals in our body, every simplex virus, right? And it will hide back in your inner ear until you've got another kick up of another virus and then it'll come out to play. 
and you have vestibular neuritis, right? By age 25, remember we talked about this briefly, 60% of the population has herpes. By age 70, we're at 90%, right? So right now, for if we looked in our classroom right now, you know, we're talking probably easily 70% of you guys have herpes in some way, shape, or form, right? If you've had chicken pox, you've had herpes. So a lot of times with vestibular neuritis, they're going to do treatments of steroids, methylprednisone. And why are we going to do this? Because in acute cases, it helps. The problem is inflammation. So if we can pop down on that inflammation and get rid of that inflammation, that helps. Um, this person did not take their meds right. Is <laughs> day one, they're supposed to take all of those meds. Then day two, they take the second dose, like day three, and they just taper down. You don't have to know the doses. Don't worry about that, right? Just don't. Don't freak out about that. What you do have to kind of know is that methylprednisone can be used to treat any itis that we have in the body, right? It's a prednisone. It's there to treat it. But again, we know also from patho that too much steroids can cause other problems, right? Labyrinthine concussion is usually a trauma as the underlying cause, and you don't necessarily have to have a loss of con consciousness. It's usually a direct blow to the head and can be a tearing or twisting the vestibular nerve. Um, blast injuries are really common to cause labyrinthian concussions. Um, rotational and linear devices, right? Some, some surveys or some studies do show that nerve fibers are really torn away. And so you lose certain ones of your um, kinocilia and sterocilia. So you lose a little bit of that vestibular apparatus. Um, but you have so many in your inner ear, your body can usually compensate for a loss of one or two, but it can cause problems for the time being. Will only affect the peripheral vestibular system. They're not going to have any central signs, right? And usually, if we do an MRI, I'm not going to present with anything. It's not like the brain's going to show that I've got a concussion in there. It's not a true concussion. It's a concussion of the labyrinthine complex. Interestingly enough, the research shown that post concussion, about 75% of children had at least one or more vestibular dysfunction signs. The testing. If they've had a previous concussion, about 90% of them had a vestibular sign. Think about that. Right? There's a huge field there that we're not treating. If all symptoms are not resolved in four weeks, vestibular rehabilitation should be recommended. And I honestly would say that, you know, especially in the case of student athlete, they should be seeing vestibular rehabilitation whether they actually have vestibular signs or not. Studies only show that about half of them receive this vestibular rehabilitation. You know, what can happen with our student athletes if more of them got vestibular PT? Just saying. There's a market there. Motion sickness. Some of you probably get this. This is a sensory conflict issue. My ex-wife got this really bad. You know, you have those three set, three inputs, vestibular, proprioceptive, and visual, and then they don't match. Maybe because of the speed of the thing you're moving in. Maybe it's because you can't focus on stuff going by you, whatever it is. Your brain store pattern doesn't match what you're seeing, and then you start getting sick. You know, pallor changes, nausea, vomiting, diaphoresis, motion sensitivity all happens. Migraine-related dizziness we talked about, vertigo, dizziness, and panic attacks can cause this, or vertigo, dizziness, panic attacks can occur because of this, and motion sickness can occur because of this. You know, you get a migraine, and it can really throw off your whole life. If you've never had a migraine, I'm going to say thank everything you have. I will take, you know, having the flu once a year over having migraines for the rest of my life. It's just they're not fun. MS we talked about, we know that it affects the central nervous system, so it can definitely cause problems. MSA, multiple system atrophy, is a progressive degenerative disease of the central nervous system. And it usually leads to cerebellar ataxia, autonomic dysfunction, pseudo-Parkinson's symptoms, corticospinal dysfunction. This literally means that the, the systems are failing. Post-concussion syndrome, right? They can present like vestibular-related TBI. We just talked about that with labyrinthian disorder. Right, cervical or cervicogenic dizziness. This is really commonly diagnosed in Europe. We kind of ignore it here, but this is patients that get headaches and dizziness because their neck's tight, right? Because they're holding their neck in a specific, it's usually after a motor vehicle accident, right? Because after you get a motor vehicle accident, you kind of tense up and you just get kind of like this, this kind of position here. And the patient will say, I just get dizzy every time I move. Well, why are they getting dizzy? Well, because they're not moving their head, they're moving their whole body and they're messing up that vestibular input. 
right? So if we can help them by loosening up this neck and getting normal inner ear function going, we can remove their dizziness and vertigo. VBI, vertebral basilar insufficiency. This is a problem with the vertebral arteries entering the back side of the brain, right? We know the vertebral arteries are the other two feed systems to the circle of Willis. And so if you have a problem where those are getting cut off, maybe you've got some stenosis of the spine. Maybe there's a problem with where they kind of come into the brain in the frame and magnum, whatever it may be. A lot of times vertebral basal or artery insufficiency are going to present a lot like patients that have some sort of a vestibular issue, right? They may have diplopia, right? Double vision, syncope, headache, visual field defects, vertigo, nystagmus, vomiting. Um, but what we'll do is, and I've had this happen where I'm working with a patient and I'm performing a Dix Hall Pike, the PT had me perform Dix Hall Pike. And I noticed that I don't, that when I'm moving them through all their motion, they don't get any vestibular symptoms until I tilt their head the whole way back in the Dix Hall Pike. And at that point, they start getting nauseated and this, and they really complain. About, one of the big ones is diplopia, the double vision. Well, what's happening is in that last position of the Dix Hall Pike, my head's back like this. So at that point, back here in the back of my neck, everything is squeezed together. And so the vertebral arteries are getting cut off. And so the blood flow to the back side of the brain is getting affected, right? And you can have autonomic dysfunction, stuff like that. The vision's getting affected because it's affecting the back side of the brain, right? If the patient presents with that, then you need to go see a neurologist because we need to figure out why they've got the problem back in the back of their brain because maybe it's a stenosis issue and maybe it's a problem with the arteries themselves. We don't know. We're going to have to find out. And the, the only way they're going to find out is by sending them to some specialist that deals with it. Some hard contraindications of vestibular rehabilitation, meaning if you see these, stop. If the patient has an unstable vestibular disorder that we're not, that's not something we're treating them for, that would be a warning sign, right? The PT would know about this. If the patient's got a perilymphatic fistula, it's not something we can treat. They got to get that treated, and usually they're going to have to have some form of surgery to close it off before we can do anything therapy-wise. If we're treating a patient and suddenly they complain about loss of hearing, I suddenly lost hearing in my left ear. Stop. We're done. If they complain about, oh my god, yeah, oh, I'm getting my ears feel like they're ready to explode. You know that feeling that you get when you go up or down in an airplane. You know that feeling, the pressure gradient change, and they're complaining about it without any pressure gradient change that's a problem. Or they start complaining about tinnitus ringing in either of their ears. It's another warning sign and we need to shut it down. If any of those symptoms are, if you're working in vestibular rehabilitation, you see any of those, the response is sit them down, put them in a safe chair, and get the PT immediately. Um, if you suspect that a patient has VBI, vertebral basal or artery insufficiency, and you, you, know, you think that they have it, it's another one. Stop your treatment, put them in a chair, put them you know, operate in a bed, however you have to do it, that they're safe, and then go get the PT and tell them what you've kind of encountered. It is better to err on the side of caution and tell the PT more frequently than it is in the case of vestibular patients. And it's, oh, no, that didn't happen. You know, the increased pressure in their ears. Yeah, he was just faking it. Better to let your PT know about it. Because vestibular functions or vestibular disorders are not something you want to mess around with if you're not specifically treating them. All right, so that's it for this lecture. Finally, it actually went the whole way through. All right, camera focus, thank you. I'm gonna stop moving so it doesn't focus anymore on me. So that's it for this lecture. Um, I think it was a good two, three hours long at this point, I don't even know. I feel like I've been talking at this computer without moving for several hours. If you have any questions, please email me. Um, I apologize, I had to make this asynchronous. I have an appointment I have to go to tomorrow. So if you have any questions, please email me right away. Uh, like I said, by tomorrow, you already have the quiz up. By tomorrow, you'll have your final up as well. I'm hoping by, let's say by four tomorrow, you should have the final up. I've got it done, I just have to post it. Um, and you should have almost all your grades posted. There are a few of that I'm still waiting on grades for. Please send those grades in. But other than that, this has been your vestibular lecture. We'll do some stuff when we actually get to lab. I will let you know what the status of lab is next week, hopefully by tomorrow as well, or today, I guess, at this point.
I won't even tell you what time this is that I'm recording this. So I hope you guys have a good rest of your day. I will catch you on the flip side. This is Mr. McKeever signing off and let's get dizzy.